Everybody ready? Welcome everyone. This is the April 20th meeting of the Yellow Springs Village Council. We have a full house. I think that a couple, Chief and Johnny, are going out to get some more chairs. So we don't want you standing. So, uh, Judy, would you please call the roll? Yes. Wintrow. Here. Asplund. Yes. Sims. Here. Housh. Here. Queen. Here. Also present are Village Manager Patty Bates, Assistant Village Manager John Young, uh, Village Solicitor Chris Connor, Chief of Police Dave Hale, and Melissa Johnny. Bain. I'm Finance Director Melissa Van Zant and Supervisor of Electric and Water Distribution Johnny Burns. Great, thank you. Um, so I have a feeling there's going to be a lot of um, comments from citizens. We will be um, uh, having those. Um, when you're recognized by the chair, you'll come up to the podium and each person has three minutes. We will not be taking comments or dialogue from the floor. You have to be um, recognized by the chair and come to the podium. And Judy, our clerk, will be keeping time and we want to hear from everybody. We'll try to balance um, the uh, different opinions and um, want to keep everything quiet and civil and we, which we expect it will be. So, um, any other announcements? We do have a special meeting um, next Monday, Monday the 27th. It will be another meeting similar to the one we had a couple about a week ago, but this will be about our electric rates. Uh, it will be an electric rate study and a discussion of our electric system, our electric portfolio. That's the other thing I forgot to announce. Please turn off your cell phones. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so it will be about um, our electric rate study. John Courtney, who is our electric um, rate um, consultant, will be on hand. The meeting will start at 6 o'clock. It will be here, and that's Monday the 27th. Any other announcements? Yeah. Um, so tomorrow at the library meeting room, there will be a free showing of the film called The Clean Bin Project. It is... Uh, a very both entertaining and very serious uh, and informative film about a well about the solid waste that we produce and are contaminating the earth and the oceans with um, and specifically it's about a couple who for one year vied with each other to see how little waste they could produce that wasn't either composted <coughs> or recycled and they both ended up with a garbage contain, trash container about this big from one year. And uh, so it's at the library meeting room tomorrow at 6. Thanks, Mary Ann. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Yeah, I want to, again, highlight the uh, fiber forum. Got some nice buttons outside, and there's also information with the agenda. We've got eight speakers, some of them coming in remotely. The goal is to basically get information about how a high-speed internet uh, system network could uh, uh, work for the village and what are some of the different options and uh, we are definitely looking for as much input on if this is a good idea for our community and this is all being organized by the Springs Net group. If you register by the end of today, you have a free lunch on Saturday as well. It's April 25th. Anything else? Well, I am very excited that we have our first consent agenda. <laughs> so we have the minutes of April 6th, 2015 regular council meeting and also resolution 2015-14 authorizing the village manager to sign a contract with Dayton Pool Management for the 2015 summer swim season. Um, just to kind of recap what a consent agenda is, it is when we take items that are um, somewhat pro forma, things that, that we don't expect to um, engender a lot of discussion or, or controversy and we package them together council will take one vote and we can move through things a little bit more quickly but any council member can actually ask for an item to be removed from the consent agenda so um, I guess that's the next thing I will ask is, is if any council member would like anything removed from the consent agenda no. well I was wanting to ask about what exactly the contract was with Dayton Pool Management. Uh, I don't know if that requires taking it it's, off. It's a simple extension of last year's contract. Okay, so the, the same amount? Yes. Can you remind me what the amount was? 
<laughs> Not top of your head. head. Is it in the? Is no, it, it isn't. It is yeah. in the resolution. Okay. So. Uh, I've got a ballpark. Ballpark in my head, it was like seventy nine thousand, but I was thinking seventy eight. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, that's that was my only question. Okay. Any um, other? Uh, I. Somebody want to make a motion? I move that we accept the consent agenda. Second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Thank you. Uh, next, uh, we have a review of the agenda. Um, are there any um, items that um, we want to add, remove, or relocate on the agenda? I just have a correction. Okay. Um, under special reports, it's not the it's the environmental commission is giving the climate change report. Not oh, okay. The climate action group. Okay. Um, Lori, um, do, you, do you want to review the um, petitions and communications, please? Yes. Um, so uh, the first one was one that was actually supposed to be in our, our uh, packet last week and didn't get in. Um, Joe Lewis wrote about the beaver flow device and flooding potential, expressing concern and wanting it to be removed. And at the last meeting, uh, Jason Hamby said he would follow up, so he went out there with uh, Tom Dietrich and Vicki Hennessy, um, and they saw two abandoned beaver dams that seemed to be causing the problem. Um, one was on the village property, and that one seemed to be the biggest problem. They removed, they were removing that one, and the others on private property. And Tom and Vicki, the two volunteers, um, said they would work with the um their tom is from the environmental commission and uh vicky is from uh gec green environmental <coughs> what is it yeah green, green environmental, environmental coalition coalition i couldn't remember what the c was um said they would try to work with the landover for removal by volunteers any other information about that at all well, there's a, a little write-up in the packet but that's essentially it yes and we think it will uh it will fix the problem Mm -hmm. and then we'll monitor. Right. Um, then we had several letters um, opposing the utility policy from Judith Hempfling, Sam Young, and Teresa Dumfe, um, which we'll be discussing tonight. Um, then um, the Courtney's, uh, I forgot to get their first names, so it just had their last name up here, um, said Vernon, thanks. Vernon and Cassandra. Vernon and Cassandra Courtney mm -hmm. said uh, thanks to our village staff um, street department in particular for um, returning a solid soccer ball and being very kind in their interaction over a soccer ball that got, got I can't remember exactly what happened, but thanks. Uh, there was a press release about the skate park, um, phase one uh, of the skate park remodel, the launch party on June 13 from noon to five. I guess that's during street fair? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and uh, Patty and staff are suggesting reinstalling new steps from the bike path to the skate park. Is that something we need to discuss? It, it came before council before and council ordered it removed and that's why I did not want to put it back in without council's right. uh, consent. So okay, yes. so we can talk about that in agenda. Um, the fiber optic has already been discussed um, and there's an open house for Yellow Springs Home Inc. at the Wyant Family Home on 140 Cemetery Street. Um, which uh, the village contributed to showcasing the first four of uh, four affordable homes built through a historic partnership with the village. Um, hors d'oeuvres, home tours, meet and greet, 5.30 to 7.30 on Friday, May 1st. And then there were some notes about Gaunt Park pool passes. Um, season passes are going on sale May 1st here in this building <coughs> in the teen center. And uh, the Public Arts Counts Commission has a note, motorcycle nose flyer that's going to be posted in Peaches and probably some other um, places around town asking motorcycle riders to uh, pipe down. Pipe down, <laughs> yeah. In a nice way. Pipe down in town, yeah. Maybe Brian will address that in his report. Yeah, because uh, we do want to see if it's okay with all of us. Okay. 
so that was it for communications of a from specific people in town there are a few other things and i did want to also note um, patty just passed me um, a note from ed dressler at 223 west davis uh, to the Village Public Works Department um, expressing that uh, they did a nice job in the new catch basins and stormwater pipe along West Davis and Phillips Street. Um, last week it really helped during um, some rain events. So we want to thank the crews for that also. Um, first, on, first item on the agenda is uh, first reading of Ordinance 2015-05, amending Section 1272 Point oh four of the codified ordinances of Yellow Springs to increase permit fees. Um, I don't. Can we read this by title only? Um, I did, which I just did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think um, probably. Yeah, I think we will just read this by by title only, and then have um, staff give an explanation. Okay. So. Judy. So this is Ordinance 2015-05, rescinding old Section 1272.04 of the Yellow Springs Zoning Code and adopting new Section 1272.04 of the Yellow Springs Zoning Code and adopting Appendix A to the Yellow Springs Zoning Code, establishing permit fees. Thank you. Can I have a motion, please? So moved. Thank you. Okay. Um, I will turn it over to uh, John Young, mm -hmm. our uh, planning staff. Uh, yes. So. Um, this is an application to uh, to basically uh, bring permit fees more in line with the modern uh, era, the 21st century. Uh, the last ordinance for permits was adopted in 1993. A copy of it is in your packet. Um, we took a look at a lot of other uh, villages and cities and other areas in, in Green County and cr across southwest Ohio and northern Kentucky, uh, comparing uh, what the rates would be. The other thing is that this is not uh, an attempt to get any more money than what would it would actually cost to be uh, to provide at cost services for some of the uh, applications to the Planning Commission and the Board of Zoning Appeals. Um, so just as a, uh, a review, the zoning ordinance has a, uh, requirements uh, and guidelines for adopting text amendments to the code. They're outlined in your staff reports. Um, the Planning Commission reviewed this in their April 13th meeting and uh, made a motion to recommend the approval to uh, Council for the permit fees. And just to go over what the changes are, uh, the typical zoning permit will go from $10 to $15. Uh, new construction permits will be $35. Uh, Multifamily or commercial buildings will be $35 plus $10. For every unit over four or every 1,000 square feet of commercial space over 5,000. Uh, sign permits go up from 10 to $15. Uh, same thing for change of use permits. The planned unit development uh, goes up to actually stays the same at 150. And the final plan application also stays the same at 75. A level B uh, plan review is a $100 application fee plus a $500 refundable deposit. And that is to cover uh, the first $500 for possible engineering costs. If the applicant goes over, the village will, take, will absorb the costs. If the uh, engineering fees go under, then we'll re uh, refund the difference. And of course, if we don't use it at all, we'll just refund the entire $500. Um, for PUDs and level B plan reapplications, that's $50, that's new. Uh, conditional use applications go from $35 to $100. And that's to cover the cost of selling, sending uh, notifications in the newspaper and also um, mailings to uh, adjacent property owners and to cover staff time. Uh, lot divisions are $50 uh, plus $15 per lot that's created. Map and text amendment requests are $200. Uh, that is increased from $125. Uh, Board of Zoning Appeals uh, variances and administrative appeals are $100. A zoning compliance certificate goes from $10 to $15. A uh, right of way vacation, excuse me, a, a, an appeal to Village Council from the Planning Commission to the Board of the Zoning Appeals is $100. And a percentage of that is actually refunded if that decision is affirmed. 30. And that's $30. And then right of way vacation requests, uh, if they include a petition from homeowners, 
or adjacent property owners, it's $50. If there's no uh, petition, is $100, and that's in compliance with section 1224.03. And then we also add a fine section. If you uh, are found starting work without a permit, we will charge you the permit fee and then an additional 50% of the permit cost. And then the, uh, the rest of the language actually comes from the, uh, the old ordinance. Uh, so those are the changes. When was it last updated? 1993. So it's a, quite a small increase in, in traditional permit fees and we come in significantly lower than uh, adjacent than, than Xenia and, and other municipalities. Okay. Do you guys have any questions? Lori, do you have any comments from the Planning Commission? Well, I wasn't there. Oh, okay. Jerry, Sorry, Jerry. Was there the other night? Uh, no. Uh, Planning Commission agreed uh, wholeheartedly that we <laughs> it was time that they know. Okay. This is also a lot clearer, I think, than anything we've ever had available. So it's good, and it's good to have it right in the zoning code. Thank you, John. Your first major project with the village. Thank you. Um, it's probably a good time for you all to be here. There's probably the real estate community is maybe a little bit more connected to this than, than other mm -hmm. folks. Um, this, this is the first reading. We'll have a second reading at the next meeting, but do citizens have any questions or comments? Is council ready to take a vote? Okay, Judy. Asplund. Yes. Housh. Yes. Sims. Yes. McQueen. Yes. Wintrow. Yes. Okay. Uh, next item on the agenda is first reading of ordinance 20. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, excuse me. Oh, sorry. I don't believe there was a motion. Yes, there was. Was yeah. there? No. I'm sorry. I completely missed it. Who? Uh, I thought I moved. Jerry, Jerry moved, moved and, and Marianne seconded. seconded. Okay, thanks. My bad. Uh, the next is the first reading of ordinance 2015-06, uh, amending sections 1040-02. I'm not even going to read this because Judy will read this, and we will <laughs> again be reading this by title only um, because we felt it best to have staff take the time to explain the legislation rather than le listening to the legalese of the, of the ordinance itself. So, Judy, would you please? Yeah. This is Ordinance 2015-06, rescinding old sections 1040.02 through 1040.04, 1040.08, and 1040.99 of the Yellow Springs Code of Ordinances and adopting new sections 1040.02 through 1040.04, 1040.08, and 1040.99 of the Yellow Springs Code of Ordinances. Thank you. Can I have a motion, please? So moved. Second. Okay. Um, Patty, are you going to be? Well, uh, Chris wrote the ordinance, so maybe um, Chris should explain the the changes, and then I can jump in, or Melissa can, okay. if someone has a question. Yeah. Uh, the draft of the ordinance simply reflects, and we did it in a strike-through version so people could see what the differences were uh, between the existing uh, ordinances and what the, uh, if the ordinance, the new ordinance were adopted, what the language would, would look like. Um, fundamentally, there are not significant changes other than, when I say not significant, not a lot of changes. There's a new sentence in there. I apologize for that, um, which effectively is, is shown in uh, 1040.02 uh, uh, re responsibilities to pay the utilities bills. Um, I would note that the uh, that there is a utility board of dispute. I, what, what's the exact utility dispute resolution board? Thank you, um, and that that body would have it consists of five members: three uh, village uh, staffers, uh, Patty and, and uh, the finance director. Uh, and then two uh, villagers, and that they would set policies. Now, that's existing within the ordinances already, but um, as matters would come up as the implementation of the new, uh, new process uh, and problems came up, it wouldn't necessarily have to go directly before council to change legislation. The, the board would have the opportunity to address those issues ad hoc um, and move forward. I, the really, when you compare the... the the proposed new ordinance against the old, other than the shift of the burden on responsibility for utility bills, there's not a significant change from what already exists within the, the village structure already. So just, I mean, I think that, so there is one large clause that basically is about 
deposits and utility service agreements. That is all completely struck. What's added to replace that is a new 1040.02 responsibility to pay utilities bill, which says the property owner is responsible for the payment of any and all charges billed for electricity, water, sewer, and sanitation service used at his or her property. Correct. And, and then I would point out that uh, the change language in 1040.08 uh, we in included a subsection A, and that simply incorporates by reference uh, the section on the Ohio Revised Code that pertains to villages and the creation of a the, uh, our dispute board. Uh, and then lastly, on the penalty, uh, the it references a minor misdemeanor. Under current law, the maximum financial penalty for, in fact, well, that's the only penalty, is a, is a fine, is $150. And so rather than put in a dollar amount, we simply said the maximum amount permitted by law that way. If there were changes that the state made on what the penalties for minor misdemeanors were, we would not necessarily have to go back and amend the ordinance. Thanks, Chris. I mean, I, I think what the citizens are most interested in is exactly what the process is going to look like. So it probably, Melissa is probably the person to come up next and describe exactly what that process will look like. Inside the packet is a four-page document um, outlining utility office procedures. Um, it starts with the preface that this would not be going retroactive after this legislation is passed, if it is passed. Um, it would only um, take effect if a lease reaches its current expiration date and is renewed and we are notified, or the tenant moves out and is replaced by another tenant and comes in and signs up for utilities. I, we go through the um, account setup for a new person that would come in. Um, after lots of discussion, we decided that we would allow tenants the, well, it would be up to the property owner whether they wanted it to be in their name or it would be in the tenant's name. If it's in the tenant's name, then they would have some flexibility in terms of working out payment agreements with us. Um, they would also be able to go on to uh, level billing and be able to work directly with the utility office in that regard. If the landlord chose to keep the utilities in their name, then that would pretty much um, leave any kind of utility you know, dispute or payment agreement uh, level billing up to the landlord so they would um, have control over that if they chose that. So. That is um, one of the changes that we made after uh, lots of discussion was allowing the uh, property owner to have the choice of the utility account going in the tenant's name or remaining in the property owner's name. There also in the packet was a new utility account registration form and it's got uh, customer information, owner information for rental properties. Um, if, the rental, if it is a rental property where the bill is supposed to be sent to um, notification of delinquent account status, whether we do that by mail or by email. Um, we are also, we've, I've been meeting with a new utility billing company and I actually met with them, um, it, was, it was last week at some point. We've been having issues with our current utility bill provider everybody that was on a college street because there are so many different variations of college street for some reason some of the t um, some of the um, residents that lived on East North College Street their bills were going to East Center College Street and there might not be a 256 East College where there is a 256 East, East North it's been a major major headache but as a result of that we've been talking to a, un a new utility billing company that's actually going to be a little bit cheaper and as soon as the bills are uh, turned around same day they would be emailed to people so they would actually be emailed to people prior to them hitting the mail so that would buy us an extra like week so in in this um, some some new things are, are coming about this whole notion of being able to email and having faster notifications is evolving and I'm hoping to be able to make some headway with that um, so the new account setup uh, there's there's an application that would have to be filled out obviously um, property owners would be involved in that um, as outlined I outlined the delinquency procedures it's stated in there exactly what the procedures are this is mostly taken straight out of ordinance with the exception of um, number two this is in there for the property owners that do have tenants in their properties 
once the following month's bill is issued if there hasn't been a payment we would notify those property owners that there has not been a payment made so although it's not classified as delinquent until the 15th that's giving property owners two extra weeks before the uh, tenants would get a disconnect notice so that we, we thought that that would be um, tenant friendly as well as property owner friendly because when the bills are due on the 15th that would give the tenants an extra two weeks to try to um, make payment arrangements or um, come in to make a payment before we would notify the landlords and it's also two weeks ahead of time before a bill would be no uh, notated as delinquent so we thought that that was a good middle ground and we would um, notify property owners of their choosing email mail telephone after the the first of the month once those bills are due um, and then it goes through what happens once a bill is delinquent after the 15th of the following month if they have not uh, made a payment then a delinquency letter or a disconnect letter uh, it goes out they have seven days to make payment um, one of the things that we've done is we've put on our utility bill message board that there won't be any extensions or anything if a disconnect letter is issued so we're trying to tighten up some of those internal policies that haven't been in writing before including that one um, once the services have been disconnected and if the account isn't brought current they would owe any outstand outstanding balance including any penalties and um, we would have the option of adding those to the property taxes along with a 10 percent assessment fee which is what we did for um, properties that were uh, pro where the property owner actually resided that we did last year and uh, we did receive some clarification from the green county auditor it sounded as if we were only able to pass those assessments on um, once a year in september but we could actually do that continuously should we need to so if property is foreclosed on or something like that we would have the option to uh, try to get those uh, utility bills onto the property taxes uh, there's also a section in here about utility disputes and that's basically um, the process where if somebody has an issue with their bill that they could file a complaint with our office and if it can't be handled um, within the utility office then it would go to the utility dispute resolution board which we're looking at resurrecting in all of this discussion the next section is access to meters this has been a real issue where some of the meters are inside people work during the day um, when the meter readers are coming out and we aren't be able to get access we've sent some letters that have kind of um, not went over well with the community because no letters have ever been sent before but it's really important to let everybody know that since right now the water is being read every three months um, we need to get in there at least once every 90 days if at all possible in order to try to detect leaks um, any issues that are occurring make sure that we've got accurate billing since things are estimated so it's just basically outlining that access to meters is really really important but um, as we move forward with this whole remote metering issue um, hopefully water will be read every month after we get all this implemented with the electric remote meters um, sewer adjustments this has also been um, kind of an issue within the department that we hadn't had anything in writing um, we do do a summer sewer adjustment which was a piece of legislation that council passed for a uh, summer uh, yard and garden watering so that's outlined in there and then um, kind of past practice was any time that somebody had a, a water leak um, sewer adjustments were being granted which isn't a good practice because if somebody has a leaky toilet the water's going down into the sewer we have to process it that there's cost associated with that so we did uh, tighten up that procedure put that in writing there's actually a form that you have to fill out public work staff takes a look at things they evaluate it if the water did go down the sewer then we don't grant an adjustment but if it didn't then we will grant an adjustment so that's just putting that in writing level billing is also something that was never in writing it was just one of those things that was just kind of uh, done and uh, basically level billing is only for our electric bills because our water and our sewer are estimated every month since they're only read every three months so every three months there's a catch-up as long as there's an actual read which again is the importance of having the access to the meters um, so we'll do uh, level billing for electric the amounts that people were going on to level billing for were never 
um, really solidified. It was just whatever a customer was comfortable with. Um, sometimes that did not work out in the customer's favor at all because they would uh, commit to a very low amount and then once the catch-up month would occur they would get hit with a pretty big bill so this is just saying that we will we will only look at putting people on level billing if they've got 12 months worth of history we our computer automatically generates an estimate for those 12 months we will only allow people to go by that estimate nothing less so that people don't get jammed up um, in terms of level billing so it would go by that 12 month average that's in the system um, and then every September it's it's put to zero payment agreements this is another thing that had never really been um, formalized it was just um, it, it just kind of happened within the office and it was very discretionary with the billing staff this is basically saying that we understand that customers may face undue hardships um, only the person whose name is on the utility bill would be able to work out a payment agreement so if landlords had the bills in their names then they would be the ones that would have to request such a thing if the tenants if the bill is in the tenants name then they would be able to work this out we are only going to um, look at requests that are submitted in writing we won't take a verbal on the phone um, people have to outline their situation in order to be considered so that we know that they're serious about that and what we would do is we would uh, take the amount that's past due and we would spread it over no more than six months and people would only be allowed to do that once per year because we do have some people that have made a habit of being on a payment agreement and that would uh, put landlord situations in, in a bad light because it, it could it could cause um, quite high utility bill to end up being put with a landlord if somebody did decide to move out so we would have um, payment agreement and if when somebody is on a payment agreement what happens is they will have a past due balance on their bill so we would notify landlords of any past due balance that's on one of their tenants bills and if they are on a payment agreement um, it would be indicated on that notification of tenant delinquency there was a postcard that I drafted that would be um, what we are proposing sending to the landlords which would be on or about the first of the month once those bills go out notifying a landlord that somebody is past due and it would just have the date and the property address it wouldn't have anybody's name on there and then it would indicate whether or not the customer was or was not on a payment agreement so that the landlord knew that that tenant was taking steps um, in order to bring that balance current with the office and it wasn't just a non-payment situation so that would indicate to the landlord what was going on there um, so payment agreements we tried to put that in writing what was going on with that if somebody defaults on their payment agreement then we will send a notice of disconnection and they will be disconnected within 48 hours so um, we won't accept checks to try to prevent anybody from writing a bad check and buying some more time we would only accept cash um, money order or credit card now that we accept credit cards and then finally we've got the disconnect discontinuation of utility services and what would happen when somebody wants to go to move out the process that um, is involved with that that we require 24 hours notice so that we can get somebody out to do a final read so that we've got a very uh, a very firm stop date for that person so this is probably a whole lot more than what council was expecting to receive but there were a lot of procedures that were going on in that office um, that have just been the way that they've always done it and it has not put um, the landlord tenant situation in a very good light with the with the passage of this um, new legislation so we were hoping to make some of these policies um, landlord friendly and um, just putting it in writing you know exactly what our office has the capability of doing each step of the way so I hope that I didn't miss anything and that's a lot of information that I just threw at everybody it's great Melissa I mean it's, it's amazing that the things that were happening without a without an appropriate um, or firm policy and I really appreciate what the department and what the staff has done to pull this together 
Um, Patty, is there anything else that you want to talk about that is, I think council will ask questions there, of all of you? Yeah, there are there are two things I'd like to do. First of all, I'd like to thank Dino uh, and Teresa, um, Dino Pallotta and Teresa Dunphy, because they did email me with some maybe suggestions or ideas of what to go into the policy. Some of them we were able to implement, some of them we weren't, but I did appreciate that um, give and take. I also wanted to note that if you keep the account in the tenant's name, one of the reasons that we decided to move forward was that with that was because that allows them to apply for some of the um, the aid that um, they would not be able to get if it were in the landlord's name. And so that was one of the also deciding factors um, to, to go with allowing it to stay in the tenant's name if that's what the landlord wants. That, so. Melissa, you might as well, I have a feeling you're going to get some questions. Because I did, I'm going to jump in here because I have a question. So that does mean that, so the property owner, can the property owner do level billing? Yes. Pro, a, a, mm -hmm. a, a, okay. Uh, On the and, but they can't do a payment agreement. They could do a payment. Whoever the utilities' names are in would have the flexibility to to do level billing or payment agreements. Okay. But okay. Uh, one of the concerns of the landlords was that um, you know they wouldn't want their tenants on payment agreements if they were going to be responsible but some landlords may have you know may have very trusting relationships with their tenants they may know them personally so if they wanted to let the tenant keep the utilities in their name and afford them that flexibility it would be the landlord's option to do that and we wouldn't um, it would just be the landlord's option to do that at that point okay. and a follow-up on level billing so is that 12 months for the property or 12 months for a specific customer? 12 months for a specific customer because, I mean, a family of four versus, you know, just a couple, that could be a huge difference. Um, we, we could take a look at six months, but if we looked at 12 months, I mean, just because prop different properties um, vary in terms of their usage in the summer months and the winter mm -hmm. months, depending on what kind of heating and cooling systems they have. So... Uh, if we could do apples to apples, this is what they were using last June and they're signing up in June, it would be a little bit more accurate. So that's why I, I proposed 12 months, but I understand that, you know, maybe council might be supportive of six months, but it just gives us a better picture of what somebody's accurate use would be. Melissa, would you feel comfortable though? Because I think that the level billing on the electric would, would probably be helpful to the landlords because they would be able to put it into their their leases um, that their tenants had to sign up. Would you feel comfortable at six months on a property history? Um, I, it, I, w I would feel comfortable with six months. I just think that if, if we want the most accurate mm -hmm. estimate for a particular tenant mm -hmm. in a property, we would have to do 12 months. But I think that if we did mm -hmm. six months, it wouldn't skew it all that much. But 12 months would be the most accurate way to go. Then again, though, I mean, it's not the most convenient because it's been a year at right. that point. So, and, and then we catch up in September mm -hmm. on electric, right? Yep. Uh, you're, you say on the last page that you'll hand deliver notice of disconnection to the customer as well as the property owner, but many property owners don't live in town, so you're not going to be able to hand deliver to property No, owners. that's that's been in our ordinance as the policy that we hand deliver when something is disconnected. Uh, we definitely hand deliver to the uh, to the actual property where it's going to be disconnected, but we could notify property owner, phone, email, mail if they wish. I mean, I'm sure that they would want it much faster, so um, we could call them. If that's I'm, I'm open to however that notification would occur with the property owner for disconnections. You'll probably just want to rewrite yeah. that. Yeah, that can make that clearer. If the property owner had an agent, could we add their agent and then notify their agent? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we could. I, that I know that's, that's uh, another consideration that we could um, add to the utility account because the property owner may have an agent we could add agent information if applicable to the utility account registration form too okay. any other questions from council yes okay go ahead um well first of all i didn't get the uh, the ordinance until i came to council nobody else did either well okay. it came so by so email for me that's a problem but, uh, and I'm not totally clear what the relationship is between this page that has 1040 things on it. Mm -hmm. 
I'm not totally clear what it, that relationship is to the ordinance. The, the ordinance itself, which is this page, mm -hmm. um, all it's doing is setting out the sections of the page that you have in your hand. That's a copy of the codified ordinance. This is the ordinance. Mm -hmm. And then what's all this? That's a copy of the codified ordinance with the strike through changes that Chris um, made no, to one, it. So that doesn't have any strikes. This is all new. This this thing that starts. Okay. Utility, that was what was in the packet to yeah. start with. That was what was in the packet to start with. Yes. yes. Right. Right. Yeah. So it's what's the relationship between this page and the ordinance? I'm not sure. I think that was just the placeholder until we got the final copy from Chris, which right. is the ordinance version that right. everybody's been referring to. So, it, is this part of the ordinance? That that's that's a straight from the codified ordinance online, and I think that that was just the placeholder until the actual ordinance was reviewed by Chris. It's the it's as it stands today. This this page is as it stands. The cur it's the current ordinance. Correct. So all of this is being thrown away. It's not valid. Well, no, not all of it. Just the only sections that are being corrected are those who are that are listed that are in the ordinance itself. Right. So everything else is staying the okay, same. Right. So everything so, in here. So I, I would not refer to that document, Marianne. I would. The document we should refer to now is the actual ordinance. And the ordinance contains the strike through so that in future, someone can pull that ordinance and and know what what it replaced. That is that will actually the strike throughs will be in the final version of the ordinance. I, I'm sorry, but I don't get it. There, there's no strike throughs in this. And if this isn't what we're considering, I don't even know why it was in the packet. That's not the ordinance. That's the current ordinance, right? Correct. The strike throughs are on this. What, what Chris, we're actually do you want to address? On. Do you want to address the, the situation? This is the proposed. But ordinance. the the ordinance for consideration, the, the, I wouldn't look at yeah. anything else. That's 2015-06. Everything else will confuse you. I, mean, I'm I agree with what Judy just said. <laughs> Part of she doesn't have a copy. <laughs> yeah, I, she, ha she has. She has. You have a copy of this, right? I have a copy of the ordinance, but yeah. this is what was in our packet. So I assumed that there was some. Perp I mean, that this was what we were being, that we were considering. Now, are you saying that this is? We shouldn't consider this. We're just no, because that that's a placeholder. That tells you what what the new ordinance is replacing. The email that accompanied your packet said. The new ordinance is not yet written. You will receive it at a later time. This is what it will be replacing, essentially. So, I mean, it gets confusing if you're looking at anything other than the, the ordinance version that, that Chris provided. Well, I had one question regarding this document that I guess is... That's okay. And go ahead, that question and is uh, regarding disconnection and during the winter. So I don't know whether this has changed or not, but... Anyway, it lists about six things that would allow a disconnection. Mm -hmm. uh, is that still? Yeah, nothing, nothing with that has changed. Okay. But I, I would like to just kind of address a common misconception that's existed since, I mean, I've started and I know well before that was, there was a common misconception that we didn't disconnect anybody in the winter. And that's not the case. We can disconnect people in the winter if any of those there instances. Of yes, there's one of them is a safety issue. Um, if Johnny's staff <clears throat> needs to repair a line, they may have to disconnect power in order to um, work on that line safely. That's one of the. Or, that's one of if, the if, notes. If their account becomes delinquent and they haven't executed a payment plan. So and I think that that's the common misconception is that if somebody went delinquent in the winter, we couldn't disconnect them. And okay, so none that of that's the, changed. The other question that I have is if, if someone's um, utilities are disconnected, and this is, I guess, a, I don't know if this is a legal question or not, but can people continue to live in a uh, dwelling when the utilities are disconnected? I would say that that no. depends on how quickly the health department gets right. there. <laughs> when the health department so comes technically, out. no, that you're not supposed to live in a dwelling that does not have utilities to the it. The village. So does that mean the village isn't necessarily going to do anything about it? But John, do you want to address that? <laughs> uh, probably not. <laughs> well, I, I will tell you. In my experience, we actually, uh, in my old employer, we had a, a situation where 
the trailer park uh, in Bellevue uh, was disconnected from uh, electric, and uh, they had to make arrangements to house them in a hotel until the until that was uh, fixed. So uh, there are instances where I mean, you cannot live in a building. It's not considered a habitable structure if you don't have utilities hooked up to it. It would have to be condemned. If if I was a building inspector, I would have to condemn the building. And, and say it's unsafe for uh, human ho occupation until until that is remedied. That would be then at the county level, not the village level. No, that's the It would be the health department and, the, and, county and the building department. The county does our Yeah. Okay. okay. Any other questions from council before we open it up to <coughs> citizen the, comment? Uh, yeah, I have one. Um, the uh, utilities dispute, mm -hmm. um, and, and maybe I did or I did not read it, but uh, they could still get a disconnect notice if they were going through the dispute. Yes, that process. doesn't necessarily the way that the way that it's written in um, the policy, and I think it might have been outlined in. Um, in the ordinance, I'm not 100% sure on that, but the way that it's written is, you if once you once you file a complaint, you have to do it before the due date. So we don't. The intention is that we don't want somebody to. We don't want people filing disputes just to buy themselves time. Okay. Um, so that outlines that very situation. Um, so you've got two weeks from the time that you receive your bill. We're saying that you need to do it before okay. the bill is due, and it's not going to yeah. buy you any time, basically. So we will handle it in a timely manner, because that's the intention. Um, these aren't exactly com uh, questions, but uh, uh, two quick comments. Under the uh, uh, Utility Dispute Resolution Board, A references the Board of Trustees of Public Affairs, and then it goes on to talk about the UDRB. And I think we need to clarify that. Yeah, I I just saw that in the, okay. in the copy as well, and and I think because Chris had it listed both ways because we were kind of going back and forth as to what we thought it should be called, and we settled on the keeping the language from the original, which was utility dispute resolution. Okay, very cool. And then a second thing, um, not so much about the ordinance, but as we tweak the procedures. Uh, it would be useful to clarify the role of the finance director versus the role of the resolution board, mm -hmm. especially in terms of, you know, who can do both approve payment plans and that sort of thing. And um, again, just since we're doing that work to clarify where everybody comes into play. Okay, council, no other questions? Okay, we'll open it up to. If I okay. Could just clarify something there. Um, the utility dispute resolution board would, would have the power to implement policies yeah. and procedures. Come up. The uh, utility dispute resolution board would have the power to implement policies and procedures. Now, the board is made up of the uh, village manager, the finance director, and the uh, electric superintendent or their respective uh, designates, and then the two village members. So the body can empower the finance director to deal with the situations that I think you're, right. you're talking about. Right. So I just wanted to make that clear. Yeah, thanks. And the two members from the two residents are appointed by council. Okay. So I will um, open up to citizen questions. We will, uh, you have come up to the, to the podium, three minutes, uh, state your name, three minutes uh, per person, and we will hear new comments, new questions before um, somebody um, gets back up again. So I saw Jo uh, with her hand first. Just a quick question so I can be clear on it. The beginning date of this whole new uh, ordinance is what? The ordinance itself would take effect as soon as it's allowed by law, but the it would only kick into your leases as they either expire or your tenant leaves and you put a new tenant in. But, but let's give an example. So this is the first reading. If if we if it goes through two readings, the next reading will be May May fourth, and it's thirty days after June, that. Yes. So June thirty 4th. days after May fourth. 
and then so anytime after anytime after June 4th if you're if you have a tenant whose lease expires or if they move out and a new tenant comes in then this would kick in for that tenant okay. not for all your other tenants but for that tenant so is the village capable now of taking readings every month not no not for electric or not for water and and uh, so we will not be able to read meters until the new meters uh, every month until the new ones are in we're going we're going to put in uh, um, radio read electric meters and that frees up the staff to do water and sewer every month is the hope okay. so yes we're we're hoping to have that done by Johnny end of the year I know I'm sorry <laughs> one year yes. but that's by, the goal by by, by December, December. Okay. and I think with all that we've gone through with all the things that have been out of order up to this time in the village office if we would wait until the new meters are in continue the way we have in the past for one year you'd probably save money and everything would just go as clean as anything you'd want to do because you're doing you're going in the right direction you're putting in new meters, right? Mm -hmm. That way, everybody's going to have a bill that's up to date. The tenant, then you can still give notices to the landlords because you're going to be up to date. You're going to know who's late, who's not late, and everybody's going to be in the clear. You're going to have their deposits. You're going to know what before they leave. You have everything in place right here everybody's going to have a 30-day notice before the tenant leaves the village and the and the owners so that we can keep in touch i'd say start when the new meters are in i'd be happy with that i don't know what anybody else saying. okay thank you thanks thank joe. You, joe thanks joe um anyone else michael <laughs> <laughs> So everybody has to do that to Michael when they <laughs> speak. Well, Since he's yeah. sitting right there. See, now Dino's not going to get up. <laughs> I'm uh, not sure how Michael no, feels about that. It's an unrelated topic. Is that okay? Uh, no. Yeah. No. Um, anyone else? Oh, Sheila. Actually, this just dovetails on. Mom, I was going to say Joseph. now that because it seems like you have put all the policies in place and shored everything up internally I guess I'm wondering why we wouldn't try that process now that everybody has done the due diligence internally and it's not a handshake and it's not a, okay we think it's this it's we have you know level billing we know what it is we're not letting people to commit what they want but we actually have the data I would recommend trying it as well for a set period of time before we implement this because now that the policies are there this may take care of the problem, which is, you know, Thank you. look internally and fix it. It may, it may be done now. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Sheila. Other comments and questions? I have just two quick questions, and they probably can be addressed by Melissa, Michael Greitzer. Um, under payment agreements, there's not language in there that notifies the landlord that the tenant has entered into a payment agreement, and the landlord would obviously be obligated for a payment agreement well that's that's not in the melissa just wait and address I'm, I'm, that. yeah i'm just talking about this and also it says that that uh, the village understands that customers due to undue hardship may require special accounts what is the set criteria that is applicable for everyone not for one case or another but what is the criteria that you would enter into a payment agreement with someone thanks mr Thank kreitzer you. anyone else sam um, I'm Sam Young, and I guess I don't disagree too much with Joe. I think that a year would be great, but I'm still here trying to influence your vote, and I have some comments. Um, last week's Yellow Springs News had a front page article, Go Ahead for Water Softening. I applaud the council for making this decision. I think it's the right decision. Um, it did, however, raise some questions relative to this issue. Um, apparently the village took the initiative, the village council took the initiative to meet with the three largest water users to get their input before making the decision. 
Um, to my knowledge, no council person has made any attempt to contact a landlord or group of landlords to get any input prior to this decision being made. I think it would be helpful if you had a consistent process and procedure. Um, you would have come to these meetings with less acrimony, if nothing else. Additionally, from that article, the Village Council decided to spend $600,000 to help three businesses improve their profit margins. Simultaneously, Council has decided to compel 20 or 30 other businesses to pay into public coffers, thereby depleting their profit margins of those businesses. I just wonder what's the deal here? Why have three businesses um, why were three businesses selected for public funding while numerous others are being required to fund the public? It doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Um, this is not only unfair, but creates a climate of, of such uncertainty that will discourage new business from locating here. Um, next issue, and I speak here only for myself. My wife, for example, may disagree. Uh, but, but I am concerned about the sale value of investments. I own both residential and commercial rentals in Yellow Springs. Adoption of the proposed landlord utility legislation will decrease the value of those investments. As Pat Ertl stated in his well thought out letter of March 26th, a developer building a commercial building in Yellow Springs will be held liable for his tenants water, sewer and electric bills while he can build in a nearby town and only be on the hook for water and sewer. If we're going to attract business investment, we're going to have to start providing competitive advantages over in neighboring communities, not continue piling up disadvantages. My point is that the same thing is true for sale values. The pool of interested buyers for rental properties will decline substantially. They'll all go to neighboring communities. Um, and this will have a substantial impact on the price one ex could expect to command when selling those assets. Can you, can, it, can, is it really legal for you to deprive citizens of their assets without eminent domain or some other compensation? I do have one last thing, I'll be very quick. In addition, one tenant of, of ours currently has a very large electric bill, multiple thousands of dollars every month, uh, with large increases expected. Another has an enormous water bill. A private individual can't possibly be expected to cover delinquencies of this magnitude, yet council has never addressed the differences, and they're not in the proposed ordinance, um, the differences between residential and commercial tenants. Has council even considered that or discussed the situation? And I know I won't get it tonight, but I would like answers to all those questions. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Sam. Anyone else? Dean. Hi, everybody. Dino Pallotta. Uh I'm going to go on the affordability issue again. I know we said it was disingenuous, and it's, it, it's not coming from a disingenuous side, that it was it's not an easy out. I still want to talk about it in the respect of this, simply this. When we talk about affordability, and you're talking about what's going to come down the line here, you're looking at the end users. As running my own business, what we've all done in my business, we all have vendors coming at us, price increases, raising, raising. We fight with them, we negotiate, we do battle, we do whatever we gotta do before we have to pay it, before we have to pass it through. But at some point in time, the increases keep coming and we have to pass it through to the end user. That's what I'm suggesting, I've been asking and just talking through this to say, this still has potential, this policy still has that potential of being a pass-through to the end user, which is the tenant. What's going, the way that I'm seeing it, the way that I'm looking at it in, in, in my side of the business is simply looking at this. You're passing through right now, if this policy should come through, you're gonna pass through over to the landlords, you're gonna pass over the, the losses, you're gonna pass over work, utility that, that's being done in the utility department. You're going to pass over work to be done by the landlords now, which is an expense, and you're going to pass over future losses to them that they have to take on. That's part of this policy. Well, in doing so, in doing that, we all have to realize that one thing, that the landlords can take on some of these expenses, but they cannot continually take on all these expenses, and something is going to get passed through. Just as any good business does, we're going to have to pass it through. And it's going to be, when that pass-through comes through, it's going to be a cross-cut. If we're going to do the securities, the rents, we've all talked about this before. But at some point in time, these pass-throughs are going to go through. 
And when that happens, that's something that we all have to take account for. It's just, there's going to be a small part that something's going to happen. What's going to happen to the tenants? Well, what I see happening to the tenants, and it's a, not all the tenants, it's a small group of the tenants, they're going to, they're going to, get, they're going to get squeezed. You're going to put an undue burden on them, and that's what we're looking at. That's what I think, Brian, you always talked about that. That's what I'm looking at, that small group. So if, you're going to, if we're going to affect that small group, you're going to affect the mix. We're going to, unfortunately, they may get squeezed out, and then you're going to look at a different mix for the, for the village. Now, that's the question that you guys each need to answer. That's something that I can't answer. That's where you're in your position, is that's what we need to look at. Can you yourself answer this question? Is this going to benefit, or is this going to be a detriment to the village as a whole? And are we going to be thriving with this? Is this going to be hurt economically developing-wise? It's been up to question, but those are the things that we need to look at to see in the full picture. Are you going to hurt the little people? Are you going to hurt business? Is it going to deter, deter this? Or is it going to be a benefit? Thanks for your time. Thanks, Dean. Anyone else? Uh, yes, John. Uh, hi, I'm John Hempling. Um, I absolutely agree with everything that Dino just said. Um, it seems like the entire purpose of the of the ordinance is essentially to transfer risk from the village onto the landlords. But landlords aren't going to be as risk tolerant <laughs> as the village is. Um, and being risk averse, they're going to move to, to um, move that risk onto tenants. But tenants that don't have a lot of money won't be able to to hold it, whether whether it is by through um you know, if they have poor credit, they won't pass a credit check, or they won't be able to get enough money together to put in for a utility deposit. Um, I mean, there's obviously a reason why um, the Green County Metro, you know, the Section 8 housing basically requires landlords to, um, it puts a limit on how much deposit they can demand. The housing's supposed to be affordable, right? Um, so, yeah, basically, I oppose this. Um, I'm also a member of uh, Black Lives Matter Miami Valley, formerly um, Green County Black Lives Matter. Um, and in accordance with our interest in affordable housing, um, yesterday we discussed this topic, and we have officially come out in opposition to it. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you. Yeah. Anyone else? OK, let's uh, come back and try to answer some of the questions. I know that uh, I think um, Mr. Kreitzer, um, Melissa, do you have those answers? Okay, I, I wrote this stuff down and I don't remember which ones happened first, but um, let's see. There was a question about, um, I think that this was the second one, criteria for payment agreements. Mm -hmm. um, basically, we could we could um, we could outline those, and it probably would be a good idea. I would like to kind of collaborate on that, though. Um, what I was thinking is if there was a serious illness or if there was a death, um, things like that. Not just I mean we've heard every excuse in the world. Not just my mom took my money to Vegas. Um, so and and part of the that's been used. Um, <laughs> part of the part of the reason by putting asking um, the the customer to put their request in writing is because I think that that just in itself is going to cut down on this. Um, but I would be very open into um, helping um, or collaborating with um, people to try to establish that criteria list. But just off the top of my head, I was thinking illnesses, death, um, things like that. Um, notification of landlords on payment agreement. Um, that was in the integrated into the postcard. Um, once there was a past due balance after the issuance of the next bill, it would go to the landlord and it would be indicated whether or not that customer was on a payment agreement. So they're going to have a past due balance when they go on a payment agreement. So that would be the time when the landlord would be notified, not at the time of the issuance of the payment agreement, but I'm open to that too if we would want to notify landlords as soon as somebody was um, entering into a payment agreement with the office. So I am open to, um, to that. Um, I'm trying to look through my notes here. I think I was missing something. Now I'm not sure what I was missing. 
So if somebody had a question that wasn't. Um, Mr. Young had the question about uh, residential versus commercial. We did not differentiate. Correct. <coughs> and the, do you want to explain the reasons or do you want me to? Um, I think that it basically we didn't differentiate between commercial and the old uh, ordinance except for we just held a higher utility deposit which still wouldn't have accommodated um, any kind of really high usage um, so we didn't we didn't differentiate it with the new policy and we've also there have been commercial properties that were owner occupied commercial properties as a matter of fact um, that had some relatively high bills and they went out of business and left and didn't pay them and so um, while we're answering questions, I could also address a couple of Sam's questions um, related to the meeting with um, large users. Um, I was involved in that meeting, but um, it was not a village council meeting. I believe I was the only village council member there. There were many more than three businesses. And it was an open invitation from our staff, Kent Bristol. It was when he was the interim manager. He, um, he, is, he sent out the invitation for the meeting. Um, so, you know, and, and, and we did take input. We had small users, we had large users, we had a number of users. And as far as I remember, it was, it was a pretty open invitation. I could go back, I could, you know, look at, at, at some of the, I don't know if there were even any meeting records I could ask. Um, uh, Kent about it. I don't believe Johnny. Johnny, were you here at that point? Could you? Uh, there is records of what was discussed at the meeting. And the attendees were the, the attendees. That I'm, I'm thinking there was like 20 people at that meeting because we held it in A and B. Okay. And Jerry, where, who? I think Marianne. Marianne. Okay, that's right. Yeah. Um, so um, and then, <laughs> Sam, you asked if this if. The policy is legal. It is legal. Ohio Revised Code allows okay, us. Trying to raise a different aspect. Okay. Um, so that's those are the questions that that Sam asked that I could address. Actually, I have others. Um, <laughs> Sam, I mean, I just asked for for comments, and you I nobody had them. Trying to answer the questions. There were others. Um, I didn't do, were there any other questions? That, that um, Sam, I'll give you three more minutes. I don't think I need three more minutes. My other questions were, um, I'm glad you reached out to, 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 for that, initiated that conversation with the businesses. Why was that practice not followed with landlords? That's question one. Second question is. On this um, policy, you mean? Yeah. yeah right. um, second question is, um, Paying $600,000 for soft water is a subsidy to almost every business in town. But what you're doing is, instead of subsidizing, taking money from every landlord. I'd like to know how you justify that. Landlording is a business like any other. All three of the people quoted in the paper asked you to do this to save costs. And that means their profit margin is higher. But for landlords, you're cutting their profit margin by requiring them to pay in money to fund the public instead of getting up. Now, I, that's the real question that I'd like answered is, why are you doing that? Okay. This is a discussion about a different thing. But what I will tell you is that the reason that there is money being saved is going to save money for every landlord. It's because equipment pipes will not take the wear and tear that they do with the with the horribly soft or the horribly hard water that we have that is the reason it's being done that is the only money savings that is that's going to come from the water softening and that will impact every user every water user will be positively impacted by that as will the village because our own equipment and our own water lines and our own system will run cleaner and will will not get the buildup of scale and lime that that it gets now I was just going to say the same thing do you want to comment uh, no okay um any other comments questions council 
Are we ready to yeah. take a vote? No. Well, no, no I think we want to. No. I, I want to. I, I have comments. Okay. Um, I've uh, become very uncomfortable with this over the weekend. Um, uh, you know, initially when it, it <coughs> became clear that uh, this was an adversarial process, I had made a suggestion that the landlords be, that, that we have a group of landlords and council people or a group that talk about it outside of council meeting. Um, I am sorry that I wasn't more aggressive in pursuing that, but I wasn't. Um, so um, in a lot of ways, I'm more concerned about the process and the impacts of the process than where we are right now. I, um, so I, I, I think that the process that we've been using, which is basically the council certainly listened to landlords, we definitely listened, but there hasn't really been an opportunity to, to engage in any kind of um, really deliberative discussion in any kind of meaningful way. And so that has tended to create the adversarial nature of this discussion. Um, and to the degree that it's become adversarial, the amount of actual uh, deliberation has, has gone down. And every, I mean, everyone is, con everyone, I think everyone is being motivated from a care about the community. And I know staff has worked really hard on this. Um, but, and at the other side of it, this weekend I was approached by two landlords and one was just serendipitous because it was my neighbor. So I have, until this weekend, no landlord or tenant, no one has come to me to t talk to me. Uh, and it actually does make a diff. It made a difference when people came and talked to me. So I would encourage people, I mean, it's getting late on this issue, but you know, if there's an issue you're concerned about, call council people. You know, it, it really makes a difference to be able to talk one on one rather than sitting up like this. Um, what else? Um, I, I read this, what was in the packet about the utilities, and this is a lot of information. I mean, there are a lot of changes that are being made internally. And then I wondered where the ordinance was, and I came, and it was sitting on our desk. And I'm not comfortable voting on this, res on this ordinance when I didn't I, even though some pieces of it were in here, but with all of this animosity that's been created and all this time to come in and find the ordinance and then be expected to vote on it, I'm not comfortable. So I guess I would, I don't know, I mean, I, I would have even sent out a message earlier, but I didn't, I've been so conflicted, I wasn't sure what I was thinking. I guess I still am not, but I'm not comfortable, I know I'm not comfortable voting on it. Thank you for being so honest. Please, no comments from the floor. I, I know people want this. This is, we need to keep some order here. Mary, I, I'm, are you done? Because I, yes, I, I want to, I don't usually jump in, but I want to jump in because um, I want to remind council that when staff brought this to us, was it in January for the first time? December. In December for the first time, there were some um, pretty strong comments from council members um, that, that, really directed staff to bring this, to, to be pretty aggressive about um, this policy and to bring it to council. Um, and so I want us to take responsibility. Um, I, I actually agree with, with some of the things with, that Mary Ann has said, but I want us to be taking responsibility for this. I don't want staff to be taking responsibility. No, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not at all trying to blame staff at all, not at all. It, and I would like to say that it, I have met with any landlord who has contacted me and asked me to meet with them. Um, I've emailed back and forth with any landlord who has emailed me. Um, I spoke to the McKee group and this was one of the topics of discussion. I know that Melissa has uh, met with and or corresponded with anyone who's contacted her. So there has been some discussion and some give and take from you know, whomever wanted to contact us, so. 
Uh, I guess I want to speak a little bit. Um, uh, this has been a very hard one, and um, I admit partly because we effectively followed this policy when we owned property um, that that shaped the way I was approaching it and thinking about it. And um, I think uh, what I wrote this afternoon was um, that it's been a hard decision and we've been very supportive of this staff, of this plan pretty unanimously from the start. And I also want to actually stop and say, I'm very impressed with the work that staff has done, not just on this part, this controversial part of the policy, but really looking so holistically at what's been going down in the utility office and the kind of, a, there's a kind of sweetness about, oh, we'll just deal with everybody as individuals, but it can cause a lot of unfairness when um, you've just kind of got ad hoc policies that are in people's heads, not written down anywhere. You got no history of anything. So trying to sort that out is a big deal. And when, and the fact that over the years, this has resulted in millions, over a million dollars in, um, delinquent payments was it was a big number to look at now that was what i think so i heard that number i felt that number and that was part of why we did have strong language saying well and we didn't like the idea of collection agencies and there was a an article that was passed to council about the problems of using collection agencies um so it seemed like and it seems like uh it seemed like a very logical thing i think my first red flag was with the issue of um, the fact that most of the people that do this do it with uh, or most of the communities that do it use uh, apply it to sewer and water and not electric and electric is big and I did ask about commercial versus uh, rental this afternoon and um, and I understand why we don't want to differentiate uh, between those but it does put a lot of burden on one business when we actually do support businesses and we and we do also support people the other thing was um the comments from john hempling and judith hempling in her letter about <coughs> the fact that communities can be more a little more comfortable with some amount of risk than property owners um, and I am concerned that in many communities that have these and maybe some AMP communities that have these th these policies in place that they really want a lot of owner occupied homes owner occupied homes are very stable uh, there's I can understand why many communities would be pushing in that direction however it's not necessarily good for a community to be strictly owner occupied. There's a lot of young people who can't be owners at this point in their lives. We need robust rental units. Um, so I, like Marianne, have come to feeling a lot more discomfort about this and I feel very bad about it because I know how much this is meant to staff. And it's been an important policy for them. And so, um, I don't know why I'm getting all emotional, <laughs> um, but uh, that's why I'm, I'm feeling less comfortable with this policy, this part of the policy, um, even though most of everything else that you're suggesting, I think makes sense. And I also want to endorse what Joe said of is there a way we can keep this as a kind of a try other things first, but we have this all this work done, and if it isn't, if we can't do something else to deal with the pressure, um, we ha we have this this work in our back pocket. But we've got a lot of things coming on in the meantime, the the um, changing of our meters, etc that I think it might make more sense to do those things first and see if there is a way that that helps. So that's, that's how I thought this through. And I really apologize that 
you did introduce this seven months ago, and it's taken me this long to really sort out my thoughts on it. Jerry O'Brien. Um, I mean, I've, I've made my comments for today, so. Uh, I have no additional comments. Um, I, I would just like to say something about the staff because I certainly didn't want to imply anything negative about the work that the staff has done. And it seems to me that a lot of what's been happening has really been staff seeing things that were happening in the past that, well, maybe it worked at one point, but it's not working now. So it's all this sort of getting up to speed. And, and I think it's difficult in this kind of adversarial situation when citizens then sort of say things like, well, you know, if you don't know what you're doing, get out of the business, which is sort of, so um, I, I do, I really do appreciate all the work that staff has done and that it becomes very difficult. To, <laughs> um, I'd just like to point out two things. First of all, while Melissa did outline several policies in what she wrote, all of those other changes are, have been made. They're already in place. I mean, they're, um, you know, the um, other than setting forth the specific criteria for um, a payment agreement, um, all of the other things like the uh, sewer adjustment policy and uh, other things that she outlined, those are already in place. I mean, we've, we've had them in place. They just were never written down. She took this opportunity while she was writing the um, policy to make sure that she got everything in there because it just she just wanted to get it all in one place. And the other um, point that I wanted to address was something that Lori said about, um, you know, most of the places that um, have this in place have only water and sewer or apply it only to water and sewer. That's because they have only water mm -hmm. and sewer. And yeah. I did take the opportunity to talk to John Courtney when he was here last week. <clears throat> and Johnny was in on that meeting and he did tell us flat out that all of his clients um, who have electric utilities use the same policy for water, sewer, and electric. So um, his indication to us was that it was widespread and that was something he was prepared to address when he's here next week to do the utility rate study, if council had that question. Okay. Can I, can I just make one comment about economic development? Uh, the city of Hamilton is an AMP partner as well and they just experienced a $5.6 million grocery store investment in their downtown and that is a tenant business in their downtown that's renovating a historic storefront so they are it does you know in my communications with people in the economic development circles this type of policy has not been on the, the radar it's not something that holds an attraction or a detriment to locating in a in a municipality so and, and hamilton amp. does have do you know that they do electric they're an, they're an amp I know they're an AMP and, community. And they do do they include electric in their policy? I believe so. Well, I'd like to know that. Okay. Uh, I mean, because I did talk mm -hmm. to economic development officials in, in the region, and, well, in Fairborn and in Xenia. To them, the water and sewer wasn't on their radar. It didn't, um, it didn't have an impact. They didn't even know it was the policy in their community. I, I am having pause with the electric. Um, and um, I would love to know if Hamilton um, actually did did include electric in their policy. Melissa, um, I know you went to Hamilton for a different meeting. Did you happen to discuss that while you were there? No. Okay. Um, related to this idea of the village ab absorbing risk, I don't I don't necessarily agree with that. I think I understand what what you were saying, Lori. I think. To me, what it is, because I don't think the village should absorb risk. I, I, you know, I don't think that that's a direction the village should go. I think that it's more about a community value of, do we want, do we want to have policies that are that that may be um, uh, that may allow for more imp for for more lower cost housing. I mean, or do we want to have policies that that um, might have a detriment to economic development to the price of rent? Um, that's that's the concern I have. Um, this, one more thing is that um, with the description of how 
how it would work for people to still be able to access the programs that support low-income people. Um, it sounds like that's almost going to be pretty much at the discretion of landlords. It'll be if the landlord chooses to put that in the tenant's name, then they'll have access to those things. But if the landlord doesn't, then they don't have access. And to me, that that is another one of the things that was kind of tipping the scales is that seems like a justice issue um, that 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 shouldn't be kind of held hostage by the landlord's determination if the if the person is low income they should have access to those those programs and, and again all this policy is doing as far as um, it, the burden, the burden for the ultimate payment will be on the landlord, yes, but the, the shifting, it will also shift the deposit from us collecting it to the landlord collecting it, and, you know, we can provide all of the landlords with, you know, the average over a year for their properties for the different uses, and then they can decide what kind of deposit they want to collect, and, you know, it's, it shift, it's not necessarily increasing the burden, it's shifting it from us collecting it to the landlord collecting it. So. And, um, and uh, what, uh, I, I guess I was just gonna, I was wondering whether you might wanna just table this. I would like to take a vote. I think it's, how does the rest of council feel? Yeah, I think we could take a vote to, you know, tabling it to me is, is not the issue. Right. We either vote it up or we vote it down and, and we move on. Uh, you know, the, the that, that's all I have to say. I would like John to do some research and possibly Melissa into the situation with Hamilton. I would, I would like more um, definitive information about AMP communities charging including electric in this I, I that's what I'm asking I, I'm asking for the next meeting I am asking I would like to know about Hamilton specifically since they since there there's a big project going on there um, and I would like a little bit I would like some discussion with commercial tenants I mean I think these large users I think when we've got a, we've got a business that uses tens of thousands of gallons of water. And we've got another business that uses a lot of kilowatts of electricity. I really would like to understand the impact and how exactly that is going to be um, factored, can be factored into a lease, can be factored into um, the equation for, for landlords. Um, I have I have supported this um, legislation, so I am going to, I. I'm just going to say I'm going to vote yes on it tonight, but I am. I want the information before the final vote. We have one more vote on this. Is, is there uh, how how would, what do you think is a good way of getting that kind of information? That you're talking about? Um, and who? Well, I'm. Is it? I don't. I don't know how we can provide the language as to how it can be factored into a lease because that's truly up to the landlord and, and how they write their lease and I they are way more versed in it than I am we can certainly check into you know Hamilton and, and other AMP communities although we talked to AMP before and they provided us with the only survey they, they had so. I I have been talking to, to people I've been talking to officials I will do that again I will make phone calls I assume that John may make phone calls other people may make phone calls I I will do my own research and and get more of the answers that I want to hear. Judy, would you please call the vote? Yes. Asplund? No. Sims? Yes. McQueen? I'm going to abstain. Housh? Uh, I'm going to abstain too. Wintro? Yes. So, so you what does that vote mean? Not much on a first reading. It doesn't mean a lot on a first reading. Well, but wait, it's what is the it's a majority of it's a majority of yes. It was a two yes votes and two yes one, but it's two out of five. 
you know, and, no, I mean, no, why, no. why did we call the vote if we're going to abstain? And, you know, I know Marianne didn't want to call the vote, but. Um, I support Marianne's uh, concern that she didn't feel prepared at the meeting um, with the ordinance. And so right. that is why um, I want her to be prepared. Chris, help. I'm looking at the charter right now. Thank you. <laughs> I know if they had recused, it would be a majority of those remaining. I don't know how that affects an abstention. I, I don't either, and, I, and I'm not being able to pull up. Do you have your hard copy? I mean, I, does the yeah. charter even talk about abstentions? I don't, I don't believe it does. But. I mean, they're not votes. I would consider them not votes. Yeah, but then we don't have a. Yeah, we do. We have three. We have three people. We have voting. three people voting. That's a quorum. I think you can wait on opinion to decide what's, well, what's going Well, I think next. even beyond the, the technical legal issue, what we have is we have two council members who abstained because they didn't feel um, that they didn't feel they got the, the, the document in front of us in time. Um, so I know it's annoying but um, it might make sense to have the first reading at the next meeting. I, I, I think it would be a, a fairer vote um, and f fairer to the situation. Um, but that's, so that's just my, my um, not legal reading, but my reading of the, the politics of the situation. Chris, I, what can, can I, I'm sorry. I was just going to suggest that you ask for three readings because uh, let's it's do already that. been noticed. As let's do that. Reading. Yes, we'll do three readings. So we'll just have this count as a first reading. I would, I would consider it a, th a three to one or a two to one vote. I would re I would look at it as a two to one vote. Obviously, I'm not an attorney, but. Um, Chris will get an opinion. I think we can agree, no matter what the vote was, to bring it back for a second reading at the next meeting. And then we'll have a third. The, the, it will not be final until the third reading, which would happen in, at the second meeting in May. Is that agreeable to council? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And just to, then a point of order, would you want your public hearing at the third reading, and I should notice it as such, or will you have two public hearings? You know, I mean, we we heard from the public. I, I mean, I guess the official public hearing will be at the third, would be at the third meeting. I mean, that's the way we've always done it is at the last reading. Okay. Okay. Thank you all. It's never easy. Um, and if you leave now, which I understand you're feeling like the rest of the agenda is not that interesting, just remember we have to leave the door open. And so if you have lots of loud conversations out here, it's hard for us to keep the meeting going. Next item on the agenda is resolution 2015-15, excuse me, authorizing the village manager to enter, enter into a settlement agreement and wholesale distribution service agreement with Dayton Power and Light and declaring an emergency. Do you want this in Does a resolution have to be an emergency? No. Well, that's how they wanted it worded in the... Okay. Um, title or whole shebang? Oh, well, I just read it. Let's just wait a second. We'll just wait a second. I don't want to talk about it now. I want information presented. 
Yeah. Guys, come on. We need to continue with the meeting. Please sit and... Okay. Thank you. Resolution 2015-15. Judy, just read it by title only. Okay, this is authorizing the village manager to enter into a settlement agreement and wholesale distribution service agreement with Dayton Power and Light Company and declaring an emergency. Thank you. Um, Patty, would you explain this legislation? Uh, yes, this is the final agreement for, um, as everyone knows, DPNL was talking about really raising our rates substantially for the power that we buy from them. And this is the final settlement that AMP has been working on. Originally, they um, they filed that they wanted to go to uh, $4.20, I believe, uh, per kilowatt month. And um, it actually is down to one dollar and I'm looking for it. I think it's a dollar thirty-two. Thirty-two, yeah. Yeah, $1. thirty-two per kilowatt <laughs> month. Um, it also changes the um, the way they uh, measure our peak. Currently it's done uh, I believe quarterly and it'll be done now on an annual basis and what that will enable us to do is to kind of put it out there for everyone um, that the, during this week they're going to be measuring our peak usage which will base our usage for the next year and so we're going to put it out there so everybody can cut, cut your power um, you know as much as possible during that week um, it's usually in the hot months it's right? usually it, it actually it, it can be later it was in I think September for a couple of the communities yeah and so we're uh, we're going to be able to uh, notice that to everyone and try to to shave that usage a little bit. But the final agreement is uh, $1.32 per kilowatt month and not $4.20 per kilowatt month. Very good. And who do we thank for that AMP, uh, negotiation? Believe it or not, AMP, thank you. Yes. Thanks, AMP. Um, and I guess I think that's um, the Western Area Service Group, too, that's was correct. involved in that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, any questions or comments for Patty, mm -hmm. Council? Okay. Citizens? Pardon? Comments or questions? Yes, Paul Abendroth, for clarification, this DPNL is charging for delivery of the energy, not for the energy, correct? This is what, what correct. this bill is. There, there are actually two agreements. Uh, there's a service agreement and a delivery agreement. Okay. Um, I'd like a this is a resolution, right? Do mm -hmm. we, we need a motion on that? Oh, didn't I ask for I'm okay, sorry. I, yeah. I'd like to move that uh, we uh, accept an authorized village manager to enter into the settlement agreement. Second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Uh, next is resolution 2015-16, authorizing the village manager to file an application with Nature Works for grant funds. Okay, whereas the state of Ohio through the Ohio Department of Natural Resources administers financial assistance for public recreation purposes through the state of Ohio Nature Works Program, and whereas the village of Yellow Springs desires financial assistance under the Nature Works Program. Now therefore be it resolved by the village of Yellow Springs, one, that the village of Yellow Springs approves filing an application for financial assistance, two, that Patty Bates is hereby authorized and directed to execute and file an application with the Ohio Department of Natural Resources and to provide all information and documentation required to become eligible for possible funding assistance. Three, that the Village of Yellow Springs does agree to obligate the funds required to satisfactorily complete the proposed project and become eligible for reimbursement under the terms of the Nature Works program. Can I have a motion, please? So moved. Second. Okay. Um, Patty, is this yours to describe? It is. Um, I was actually contacted by uh, Chris Bell Bednar last week um, because the deadline kind of got away from her. For nature works the deadline application deadline is may 1st and the way it works in green county um, everyone gets together and cooperatively kind of decides who is going to get their project funded from year to year because it, that way it gets passed around to the different entities on a fairly regular basis um, this year um, there were 40 i believe 49 thousand dollars plus in nature works money available and the two entities up to be funded were Yellow Springs and the city of Xenia. Um, so we both sent our proposals to Chris Bell and uh, everyone voted on it and decided to split the funds. So if the village decides that um, we want to pursue this, um, 
what we will apply for is um, new playground equipment for the toddler playground out here by the skate park. Um, you have this in your packet, which is the proposal. Um, the front page is the equipment as it currently stands. The second page is the proposed new equipment, and the third page is the budget. Um, so essentially, we would get um, $29,000 worth of equipment um, for $7,000. Um, part of our part of our contribution uh, would be in kind. It's a 75-25 grant. Part of our um, match would be in kind of um, labor to install it, and the rest would be um, the per actual purchase of the uh, equipment. So, and I know that um, Nadia is working with us on on that looking at that and the location will be where it will be where the equipment is now we'll just take the old equipment out and put the new equipment in but it'll be the same area and the swing set is remaining that it, will have the it, skateboards yes added. the swing sets remaining it but it'll it'll be moved back to the original location okay where it was and Nadia is working on what she was looking at the um, there was a question about the what it was actually right. made of okay. so and is there um, so that there's a toddler piece which you know this I remember when this when this um, playground went in it was specifically because mm -hmm. Mills Lawn did not have accommodations right. for toddlers right. and yeah. okay um, any other comments or questions from council comments questions from citizens Bringing it back, back to council table. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Okay, uh, now is the um, time in the meeting where we hear from citizens about items that are not on the agenda. Um, same rules apply. Come up to the microphone, state your name, and you have three minutes for your comments. Um, anybody here to talk about something that's not already on the agenda? Yes. Henry Myers, 247 uh, Whitehall. Um, um, this is a uh, uh, out from left field type thing, discussing that that thunderstorm out in the uh, over the horizon that that you guys see of of um, no large uh, manufacturer coming to the village, and how are you going to get uh, income taxes or whatever coming in? Um, and in kind of thinking about this, I've come to the conclusion that Yellow Springs has a very regressive uh, taxing system, taxing and levy system. And I'd like to uh, give you just a sketch of it on this. On the one hand, um, say a, a couple that uh, uh, both adults work outside the village. Um, they have a, a what, 250, 300,000 dollar home, but, but they work in uh, municipalities that charge a, uh, their own income tax, a, a fairly decent one. So they are not taxed by the village. But as we, as we know, uh, the village has a, a fairly hefty uh, levy, and, um, and we all assume you know, that the village gets a portion of it and everything. Actually, in, in doing the math, much to my surprise, the village only gets 15% of the levy that that we all pay um, twice a year, uh, which which for this this uh, family here, um, you know, really amounts to uh, not uh, not quote all that much. Another couple in the village, um, let's say uh, one of them is. Uh, Going after the the dream job is is self-employed and everything. The the other person uh, works downtown and everything. Uh, they recently bought a a uh, uh, you know a home and everything. Uh, they're, they're fairly young and everything. Um, in their case, the self-employed person is is charged one and a half percent income tax. The person downtown, one and a half percent income tax. They also have a portion of the levy, this 15 percent, which obviously is smaller, going going to uh, to the village. Now, 
This is not capitalist versus la versus labor. The, uh, these are two good families, uh, the kind we want in Yellow Springs. Kids go to the school, they participate in the village, but they're on different paths in our journey through life. But the, the difference in what they pay for the village, for, for police and all this, is that the three minutes? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. You yeah, know, it's, it's, a, it's substantially, substantially different and is regressive, which, which I, you know, is embarrassing to me. At, at the least, have someone other than my my finances check it out because comparing levy amount versus uh, income tax, you know, obviously is a, is a little bit of an iffy thing. But I think we have a regressive uh, taxing system. The final thing I'd like to hit, obviously, one of the things is going to be that the that the people working outside. Uh, the village and whatever city um, is paying income tax, and why should they be hit twice? Uh, the person, the person, the self-employed person is being is paying a double uh, social security tax. In our complex tax system, you know we can't especially say you know what's to what. It's who, how do we support the village on the items that we want? Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Myers. Any other comments? Yes, Mario. Sorry, we couldn't take you earlier. Oh, that's fine. I, you, I, uh, you didn't want to jump into that? I apologize. <laughs> I, uh, <clears throat> well, I appreciate everybody being here, and thanks for um, the opportunity to speak uh, in front of the council. My name is Mario Basora. I am uh, both the superintendent of schools here in, in Yellow Springs, and I'm also a, a community member, 335 Kingsfield Court, and proud. And I'm here to talk about uh, school levy. So on May 5th, we have a uh, school levy coming up, and it's a renewal levy. And so uh, a couple things I want to share with you, if you don't mind, about that levy, and hopefully the community is watching and can, can hear the information as well. Uh, before I do that, I want to thank the council for your support uh, with the baseball and softball fields uh, last year. It's making a huge difference for our kids right now, and um, it really is uh, what you did and the courageous work you did is, is much appreciated by our schools. and, and uh, Kids are not getting any bad hops anymore, so we, we greatly appreciate that, and uh, thank you for your work there. Um, so issue two is what it's going to be, and it's a renewal uh, emergency levy that's going to be on the ballot, and it, I think it's going to be the only vote for Yellow Springs folks that's on the ballot, is my understanding, so it'd be kind of interesting. So we're hoping people will get out and vote, and we're, we're a little concerned that folks won't come out, but we, you know, in this town, I think people come out to vote, and I hope you'll, you'll do that on the 5th. It's an uh, 8.05 mil renewal levy, which will cost uh, $247 a year per $100,000 in property valuation. Uh, I want to stress that there's no added taxes being collected through this levy, and, and that this levy's been in existence now for 16 years. Uh, so we've been collecting the same amount of money, $1.06 million, for the last 16 years, and, and we're, we're asking uh, to renew it for 10 more years. And so it's a straight renewal. No additional taxes are being collected, and it's uh, been on, uh, it's been, been around for, for uh, this point 16 years. So a couple things about it very quickly is that it's going to help protect uh, our small class sizes that we have in Yellow Springs. If you ask folks from other districts, they'll tell you very clearly that our district has probably the lowest class sizes of any, any school district around. We, we like, we're proud of the fact that our kindergartens are all under, right around, we don't go over 20 kids with our kindergarten kids intentionally because we think that's critically important. Uh, it will protect our strong arts programs, which continue to, to do well, and, and actually we're going to add a... Um, a general music and uh, vocal music to the middle school next year for the first time in, in years, and so we're, we're thrilled about that. It will continue to have free athletic teams for our kids, and so many other districts are pay to play. Well, not in Yellow Springs, and, and we're really excited about that. And it will help us continue our work with our innovative project-based learning model. To wrap it up, is 13% of our revenue, our general operating fund, is, is, is what this levy is. So without it, obviously, all these things that we have that I've, I've just described would be at pretty significant risk. And so I, I want to encourage everyone to go out and be sure to vote uh, on May 5th. And it's uh, going to be issue two, which is a renewal levy with no additional taxes. So thank Thanks, you very much. Perfect. I think that you and Mr. Myers must have coordinated a little bit since you're kind of talking about the same subject. What, but what it does um, bring up to me is that the first time our, and, and Thanks for, for talking about the, the your school levy. So I sorry to digress to the to the village levy, but the first um, before we put the levy on the ballot for the first time, 
we did some education and some discussion about revenue opportunities for the village. I mean, we did a, just a little bit of a primer for the community on um, just understanding and, and looking at alternatives, as Mr. Myers mentioned, of the reciprocal income tax. So I'd like to plan on doing that again, Melissa, to, to look at, at, you know, not to look at our whole revenue situation. So, and, and to keep in mind that, you know, we, we work, the schools are important. The schools um, are, are um, use a lot of property tax. I mean, and, and so we, we want to work with them and make sure that we're supporting each other in how we're, we're taxing um, our citizens. So. To the degree that we have control right. over it. A yes. lot of it, we don't decide, it's your right. state it's your state right. government, your state legislatures who make a lot of these decisions. But to, to we will be talking about this, Mr. Myers. I mean, it's not going to happen yeah. soon, but it's going to be happening this year because we, you know, we are looking at a levy renewal. So we appreciate you bringing it up. So we are going to take a five-minute recess um, before we have our special reports. So thank you. Okay, we will reconvene the meeting. Um, we are moving on to special reports. First, we have a monthly finance report from our finance director, Melissa Van Zandt. Um, before Melissa gets up, uh, I sat with her earlier this year and we, we kind of talked about uh, trying to make uh, things a little bit more visible, plus a little easier uh, for council to uh, kind of see what's going on financially. So I want to thank uh, Melissa for yeah. uh, taking the time and starting to, uh, it's not a complete package, which she'll say, but it, it to start at, mm -hmm. at trying to give everybody a little mm -hmm. bit more visibility into uh, uh, what's going on. And and I felt, and she also felt that, that charts and graphs will, will help everybody. Very yeah. helpful. The bar yeah. graphs. Very, very okay. Helpful. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Big thumbs up. Thank you. Thanks. So just as uh, Jerry had indicated, um, this is kind of the first crack at the first quarter, uh, a quarterly financial review. So it said monthly in the packet, but this is to go over the first quarter. Um, I'm going to try to keep this kind of brief um, just because it's getting late. Um, I, I did break this down by the major funds, general fund, uh, special revenue funds, and then the enterprise funds. Although most of the attention is, is going to lie with the general fund and the enterprise funds. Um, with it only being the end of the first quarter and we've only got three months under our belts, um, there's nothing really major, so I'm just going to point out a couple of the highlights. Um, the property taxes are received um, twice a year, so looking at what we received in the first half, they were slightly above where we uh, projected them to be. Um, the income tax is just slightly lower, but it's it's just by a, a, a small amount. Um, and then the the kilowatt hour tax is supported by the uh, is transferred in by the general fund on a monthly basis. So those are the three major sources of revenue that we have in our general fund, and all of those are pretty much on target. So nothing really uh, major with those expenses. They're kind of skewed when you read the reports because we've got encumbrances in there um, that roll over from the year prior. We've got the transfers out that happen with the general fund, which kind of skew things as well. But if you kind of extrapolate some of that stuff, we're at 23%, we should be at 25 So general fund expenditures are on track with all those departments. Um, there was a, a bit of an increased expense in our auditor's deduction department because um, in our property tax settlement there was an $8,900 expense that wasn't budgeted where we were given too much money in a state tax so they took it from us. Um, so that was that's going to have to come um, in a, a supplemental appropriation later in the year. Special revenue funds, really, those are all support. All of our special revenue funds are supported by transfers in from the general fund. We do receive some gasoline and some motor vehicle license taxes. Um, so those are outlined in the chart, and those are um, above budgeted. So we're doing pretty good in that area. Um, expenditures, or I'm sorry, enterprise funds. If we take a look at the revenues there. Electric at this point in the year is doing a little bit better than what um, was expected. 
sewer and solid waste are pretty much right on and uh, water funds a little low it's a seven percent less than what was budgeted but at this same point last year revenues were down five percent from what was budgeted and i'm going to contribute that to the time of the year just because in the summertime people use more water so i think that that's going to rebound but it's going to be something i'm going to keep an eye on um, in terms of expenditures those are also skewed because of the encumbrances um, for the year because like the electric fund we budget for the um, power cost that we're going to have all year so it looks like we've spent a lot more money than what we uh, should for this point in the year but I didn't see anything crazy so um, I'll just keep an eye on all of these things and um, continue to submit the monthly reports I'll take any feedback if there's anything more or less that you'd like to see in a quarterly review I tried to do some graphics as well um, with some uh, text and some highlights but um, I'll continue to submit the monthly reports and then quarterly I'll go over um, this stuff more in depth in the packet like I did um, this time so excellent so if everybody's okay with the report any comments or questions yeah. council thank you I mean like uh, Jerry said having the uh, graph is very helpful um, both to see budgeted and actual but also to see the amounts and how the amounts like for example the amount of money coming in from electric as opposed to water and sewer. Mm -hmm. and I'll marker the expenditures as the year goes on it's just so early on in the year right now that it really wouldn't be very beneficial so I just took a look at it and there wasn't anything that seemed to be out of place so um, I do have uh, two other things in which to add um, kind of on the heels of the financial review one of the things that was in the audit and um, has never been set up within the history of the village was an unclaimed funds fund um, which is really important to have so I did go through any of the uh, stale checks that were not cash that were just on our books and I have provided a one-page sheet that has everybody's names and the amounts um, of those unclaimed funds and they're out on the table they're going to also be published in the newspaper and they're also going to be on our website and that's going to be something that will be kept up with continuously so um, I did provide that out on the table um, and the very last thing that I have for council is I had came to council last meeting about the remote electric meters which this is all very timely discussion um, with the um, you know utility ordinance and uh, procedures and everything else we are reading our electric monthly we are reading our water and um, as a result the sewer charges um, quarterly we were approved for a grant through the BWC and in writing that grant we outlined all of the costs for um, replacing all of the meters in town to show the village's support for the project because council was supportive of moving forward with the purchase of electric meters it was my intention that this would be phased in that we would um, do some this year we would do some next year well in the grant award process we were notified that the entire project would need to be done and would need to be purchased within 90 days of receipt of the grant funds the letter for the grant um, said that they were out of money for this year and that we wouldn't get it until after July 1st which bought us some time um, that money was deposited last week <laughs> so I did not expect that at all so um, I have been working very closely with Johnny the electric superintendent and um, we did decide to go with a different vendor as a result of him going to some training recently a different vendor that um, provided a different meter that was going to better fit his needs it was gonna um, save us approximately fifteen thousand dollars overall um, so the replacement cost of all the meters in town would be a hundred and eighty four thousand um, it was going to be a hundred and ninety nine thousand with the original proposal and the original <laughs> product and vendor that was selected so council's commitment which there is a one p uh, one page uh, piece in your packet remote electric meter purchase proposal revision and council had committed to ninety five thousand dollars <laughs> this year coupled with the safety grant of forty thousand dollars there's going to be a remaining amount of forty nine thousand one hundred fifty three dollars and ninety four cents to finish out this total project so if council is supportive of that extra expenditure in this year versus next year um, this would secure that grant um, if we don't do the whole project we will likely lose the grant and have to give it back 
So um, the electric fund is able to sustain that kind of additional purchase. So I am going to turn this over to council for their consideration and how to move forward. I do apologize for this little hiccup. Um, I thought that outlining our commitment to this entire project um, would allow us to kind of space this out, but it did not in the end. So I have two questions. When do you need a decision? And I assume we need legislation. Mm -hmm. When do we? When do you need a, deci a decision? Um, we would have to have the purchase complete within 90 days. They want it implemented within 90 days, but I would ask for an extension. Mm -hmm. and, and, likely get that. and Johnny, you said. I mean, this does sound daunting to me, but you're. You feel as if we can do this? I, I think it's possible to have it done by December. I have talked to New Carlisle, and they just went through the same process. <clears throat> and they would they file for extensions, and as long as you were working on it, they continued to grant. Okay. But uh, yeah. that would be a it's going to be a daunting task to change 2,300 meters in a little bit of time. And I mean, since we're getting one grant from from BWC, I mean, essentially we're getting another grant from BWC because of the ret going to prospective billing. Do you know that we're going to get? A, they're going to basically pay or refund um, like a quarter's worth of um, BWC in, uh, of insurance payments. I'm not when sure they about go the to, when insurance. They, when they go to the prospective payments as, as, as instead of retrospective. You should look into that because we're probably going to be due a few thousands of dollars from BWC on that. So um, they're actually sending checks. Yes. Yes, we we have they they did start doing well, that and we received we were it's got like a two year lag. But this is this is another check. This okay. is because they're I'll moving from to prospective billing as a, uh, paying ahead as opposed to paying behind. So okay. look into that. But okay. I, I'm council. I'm supportive of I this. We do um, it so yes. whatever, yes. however yes. quickly, whatever count you can do to bring this legislation to us, I would support. We would support. Are you done with your report? Do you have anything else? No, on that? that was the last piece of it. And there is something that I was going to bring up in, in my report, but if I wait that long, Johnny will have to stay, and I'm sure he doesn't want to. <laughs> um, and I, Johnny, if you would come up maybe and give council a quick report on the poll inspections so that they understand the, the expense <coughs> that is going to be coming. As well as the meters that we'll be replacing this year. <laughs> Uh, we have started poll inspections. We're two weeks into it by Alamon. Uh, they have tested 898 polls. 88 of them have failed, and 29 of the 88 is uh, crucial. So it's right about 10%. Now they hope to be done by the end of the week, but they still have another thousand polls to test. Uh, with that being said, material average per poll is about three thousand dollars that's if the staff does it uh, so if we get these meters implemented you know we'll be we've already changed 22 polls uh, in a year and three months since I've been here uh, we just changed one on Elm Street uh, that has been leaning for a number of years and that would have been a priority. Uh, we actually have one at Mills Lawn that is a priority that they're going to change. Uh, we we're going to try to hold off to at the end of the year, but if it falls, uh, I don't want one of the kids to get hurt. Right. So we're going to Absolutely. we're going to change that immediately. Okay. Uh, so with that being said, the poll inspections were necessary. We was hoping that it would be a lower number, around one or two percent, but as of right now, it is still at ten percent. And, and Johnny, a non-crucial poll, what does that mean? A non-crucial poll, they're saying anywhere from three to five years. Okay. It needs okay. to be changed out. If you drive around town, you'll notice uh, some polls may have a red tag on it. Mm -hmm. If it's a red tag with an arrow in a circle, that means that poll is extremely bad. So the plan is to <laughs> is to do the critical polls That's and correct. then over maybe over a five-year period then that is correct. Phase the rest of we, them in. We would start 
changing poles out on a regular basis okay. uh, depending on the severity of the poles. Okay. And majority of them are in the back right of ways. Okay. And Johnny, can you explain these the pole inspections are supposed to be done every five pole years? Pole inspections are supposed to be done uh, every pole is supposed to be inspected within ten years. And how long has it been it, since nineteen ninety one. Oh, wow. uh, so it is with the windstorm and all that uh, a lot of poles that? were replaced but uh, we've got a lucky regular basis. and so. thank you for last night by the way yes. for those of you <laughs> south of town we had a power outage and the guys were out um, in the wet in the New cold storm. in the wind and yes. uh, we appreciate it okay. good, good job Johnny thanks Okay, now we're moving on to. Before we, oh, do sir. we need? Do we need a motion, a, a Patty, on to the, or bring us something back on? I mean, we um, just, it'll be a supplemental it. appropriation, correct, yeah. Melissa, for the extra. Yeah. So it'll just be included with this. If you want to do a motion now to go ahead and and submit it as a supplemental appropriation, then Melissa can do that as she brings you. Um, a list of them later in the year as a housekeeping matter. Okay. Are we talking about the polls now? Or I think no, we're talking no, about the, the meters. The, uh, the meters. meters. Um, in terms of financial report, do we need a formal motion accepting that report? Judy, I'm looking at you. For the auditor? For the auditor? Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Yes. So, Lori just made a motion. Second. I second. <laughs> All those in favor, <laughs> signify by saying aye. 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 Okay. Thank you. Um, Mary Ann, okay, uh, I will yeah. have you introduce yeah, this I'd like next to introduce, presentation. Um, Deward Headley, who is on the Environmental Commission, and um, one of the activities of the Environmental <laughs> Commission is uh, to be looking at the impact of climate change, and uh, Deward is the primary author of this first quarterly report on climate change, the impact on Yellow Springs and the region, and uh, the report also contains some of the things that are being currently done, and every quarter will be added additional things that people are doing locally and regionally to address climate change. So this, uh, this was in the council packet. I had asked council members to read it. Uh, the report will not cover everything in the packet, but particular council members and citizens, if you have questions, ideas, uh, after the report, we would love to hear them. Thanks. Welcome, so there's Deward. The, the PowerPoint didn't make it in the packet, but there are other than a couple of graphs, there's nothing in the PowerPoint that's not in the report. So what we're trying to do today is just provide an educational uh, introductory view of the basic science of climate change. It's a good place to start. But then we really want to go into the impacts, um, what other communities are doing, the impacts to Yellow Springs, and, and um, what people in Yellow Springs are doing, and where the opportunities are at. So the basic science of climate change is the atmosphere works like a greenhouse. Uh, we've known about this for 200 years or so. Um, the better the greenhouse works, at, uh, you know, the thicker the windows on the greenhouse, um, the more heat gets trapped, and that's you know what, what happens when you have increasing greenhouse gases. Temperatures go up, ice melts, sea level rises. And there's you know, uh, the um, climate.nasa.gov is a great site to go to. It's all graphs, really easy to understand if you want to know more about the science. So so what? Sea level is going to rise. Um, the oceans are then going to start to acidify and. Um, there's going to be some dramatic shifts in weather patterns, right? So those are the, the basic things that are going to happen. And uh, we're already starting to see some of those things happen today. Uh, so the first quote is from the International uh, Panel on Climate Change. Um, there's also a similar quote in the, the report from the EPA. We're already starting to see the impacts of climate change throughout the world, including here in Ohio. Um, essentially, what it comes down to is that we're going to have uh, significant changes in weather patterns over the next uh, 30 to 50 years. Um, even before that, uh, we're going to see some significant changes that are going to cause things like uh, potential global economic losses 
of 3.2 percent of the gdp which if you're an economist that's a pretty scary number um, there's going to be freshwater scarcity in a lot of places uh, there's going to be decreased global food yields uh, we're going to see uh, big disruptions in marine f food supplies i really like shrimp i'm disappointed about that um, and we're also going to see disruptions uh, to industrial supply chains All right, so those are some of the things we're going to see globally um, what we're going to see in Yellow Springs is really two, two classes of things we're going to see in Yellow Springs. We're going to see things that happen here locally, and then we're going to see the impacts of those global changes. Um, one of the things that we're going to see is that here in uh, our part of Ohio, we're actually going to see water deficits. It's going to get wetter in the spring and winter, and it's going to get a little bit warmer in the summer and drier, and as a result, we're going to see net water deficits which is uh, kind of interesting. It's going to be wetter part of the year, but overall during the summer, we're going to see water deficits. Uh, we're going to see increased uh, weather, severe, severe weather events. We're going to see heat waves and flooding, um, and we've seen a little bit of that recently uh, last year with the big rains. Um, we're also going to see reduced air quality with um, the increased heat waves that comes with a lot more burning of fossil fuels and results in uh, 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 poor air quality. Uh, waterborne disease, we've already seen that issues with uh, mosquitoes in Yellow Springs. We're going to see the flooding is actually going to cause uh, more issues with that. And then finally, all of that's going to boil down into agricultural challenges where you're going to have um, a, a challenge with rationing water. You're also going to have uh, different species of weeds and insects coming in, so agriculture is going to experience some, and that's those are the local challenges but the the bigger more important challenges are things that are going to they're going to happen globally they're going to impact yellow springs uh, one of those is cost of living is going to go up because most of the things that we get and that we use uh, the durable goods and all of that comes from outside of yellow springs and costs are going to go up to produce those things and to ship those things into yellow springs um, food supply uh, costs are also going to go up there's going to be increased Scarcity, I don't know if you've been paying attention to what's happening in California and Mexico, but that's right in line with the, the climate change models. It's going to get really dry and really hot in Mexico and California. I don't know how many of you pay attention to where your uh, produce comes from, but that's where it comes from, uh, certainly this time of year. Um, the other interesting thing, there's probably going to be a lot less funding available for villages like Yellow Springs because other parts of the country are going to be more significantly impacted by global change like sea level rise and the droughts in California. So Florida and California and other coastal places are going to be requiring a lot more federal and state funding. Uh, in Ohio, the state funding is probably going to be concentrated up with uh, issues around Lake Erie, things that are going to be happening there. The, the lake levels expected to uh, decline. They're going to have to do additional dredging. Uh, they're going to have issues, continued issues with algae blooms and things like that. So less money for Yellow Springs. Dewart, can I ask a question more yeah. about the water deficits? Since we have groundwater, and it, yeah. I mean, if we are getting moisture just at different times of the year, isn't, isn't it being stored in the aquifer? That's uh, not entirely efficient. It, the, the recharge happens all year long. Certainly uh, that some of that water will recharge, but also since there are flood events, most of that's just going to run right down the Little Miami River and be gone. So there are things we can do. We'll talk about, uh, when we get to what we can do. There are things we can do to prepare for those kind of changes, okay. right? And things that we should heat. And the last one, which is uh, kind of interesting to think about, um, there's going to be uh, mass migration and security threats associated with it. Millions of people uh, are going to be displaced. They're, they're where they live is not going to be habitable. It's going to become hot, desert, or flooded. And so those changes are something that most people don't think about, but there's going to be a lot more migration. And in a place like Yellow Springs, a nice place to live, it's something we can think about. It's an opportunity and a threat, something we should definitely think about. So if we look at what, what we can do, one of the things that we absolutely should do uh, is to take action to reduce our carbon emissions, our, our carbon dioxide emissions. The unfortunate truth about that is even if the entire world were to stop uh, their emissions of carbon dioxide, it would take thousands of years to reverse the changes that are going to happen. 
so the cat's out of the bag we can't get the cat back in the bag but maybe we cannot let the next cat out so we've got to we've got to do what we can um, to, to lower our emissions maybe it's a bag of cats it's a good visual I like it. Um, so so since cats are already out of the bag, we have to prepare. We talked about the water and what we could potentially do around water or potentially do around waterborne illness. And we can adapt to those things. We can prepare for them. We can make sure that we're not bre breeding mosquitoes everywhere, but we're, we're conserving water, things uh, for use in the summertime. So we can, we can adapt and we should adapt to those things. And the other thing we should do is since we really don't understand fully what's gonna happen and some stuff's really gonna come out of left, left field, we have to think about becoming a resilient community and that there's a lot of things that we can do. Yellow Springs in general is a pretty healthy, resilient community, but we have to be prepared to, to adapt on the fly for some of these changes that we don't see coming down the road. So those are, the, those are the three things that we can do. If you look at what other local governments are doing, and I think this is where it really, um, where the rubber hits the road, a lot of communities are uh, forming uh, formal climate action plans and they're joining a group called ICLE that used to stand for something but now it's kind of like HP and IBM they just call themselves ICLE but it's about local governments for sustainability and they help uh, cities and local governments develop climate action plans in Ohio Akron Alliance Athens Cincinnati Oberlin and Youngstown have all joined and either have climate actions plans in place or are developing them Overall, a climate action plan, it's kind of hard to read this graphic down the bottom, but essentially what you do is you figure out how much greenhouse gases you're emitting, you set goals to reduce them, you enact a plan to reduce them, you measure, revise, and continue going around that loop. Um, notably, Oberlin, um, who a group of us recently went to, vi uh, to visit and talk to, has been recognized by the White House and they're also in the running for a $5 million prize for their climate action plan. And candidly, I'm on camera, it's not that impressive, all right, what they've done. I think, I think, <laughs> I think we could do and have done a, a lot of interesting things. I'm not going to go through the laundry list, but there's a lot of things that uh, can be done across housing, energy, waste, transportation, food. You have cross-cutting strategies like zero waste, which, we, which is a topic in the community local government operations, efficient buildings, efficient vehicles, um, and what's happening with industrial manufacturing. So those are, those are the areas. Um, there's a lot of opportunities uh, and some of those things um, we're already doing. So even though we don't have a climate action plan in Yellow Springs, there's a lot of people, like some of the people in the audience here and a bunch of other people who said, and you, uh, the Village Council have said, let's do something about this. We don't necessarily need a formal plan, uh, the village contracts around renewable energy um, is a big, huge thing. Um, local solar, as uh, controversial as that is, um, is another important thing. Food and agriculture, there's a lot going on with community-supported agriculture, local growers, the farmer's market, and a lot of people raising chickens, um, which is actually a village resolution supporting uh, the village chick. No, that's supporting... Uh, the community gardens, there's actually an ordinance allowing chickens, which not a lot of places do. Thank you. Um, in buildings, you know the whole story there, passive houses, highly energy efficient houses, the new things around small houses, all of those are tiny houses. All those things are very important. Great adoption of bicycling and walking in town. We've got the what I like to call the Sea of Prius. There's a ton of uh, energy efficient vehicles, electric vehicles are starting to take place. And there's a strong desire to do a lot more. There's a whole zero waste effort. Um, there's everything that Community Solutions is doing around education and trying to move the community forward. There's a, a group called the Yellow Springs Resiliency Network that is meeting and working on, on trying to drive change there as well. And that's, there's a lot of groups throughout the community that are interested in moving this issue ahead. So that's what we're doing. What can we do? Or what, where the, what, where are the near-term opportunities uh, I think the first one is let's get on a, a timeline to develop a plan, right? Let's, let's look at how we do that. Um, continue in pursuit of renewable energies, especially local affordable renewable energy is huge. Um, continuing to support um, the actions being taken by residents, organizations like Antioch and, and businesses as well 
anything that the village can do there, um, really important. And then finally, including climate action considerations in all of village purchases and contracts, like what's being done with the waste contract, for instance, is, so those are some of the big opportunities, right? The real question though is, what would you like to see us do next? It's a huge, complex, ever-changing topic. What do you want to see us do next? <laughs> I mean, this is an impressive report. I mean, what I would say is what what do you think you can do next? What can Environmental Commission do? I think that, you know, this is something that, that I don't know that, that we could commit a lot of staff resources to, but, you know, it, where, what kind of support? This is incredibly impressive, and we really appreciate it. And I know there's a lot of expertise on on environmental commission and, and also on and the, energy the, uh, board. the energy board. And, yes. and yeah. so, you know, I, I guess I would, you know, like like to hear maybe a proposal from you all. I, I, I'm certainly supportive. And, you know, I think we really are doing a lot. I'd like to see how we can communicate that better. We're not communicating the Efficiency Smart Program nearly as well as we should, and it's a great program. And, um, you know, one of the points in here talks about um, energy improvements to, to, to rental properties <coughs> and, and to properties in general. So, you know, there's a lot of things that I would, I would definitely like to see us do, but we need we need your help. Okay. Yeah, well, you, you talked about the, the action plan. Yep. Um, and you talked about Overlands is not that great. <laughs> right. So I'd like to see us have a great plan. Um, what type of timetable would we be talking about in putting the plan together? Because I'd like to, to direct you guys to, to move in a positive direction. And to me, if, without a plan, it's hard to hard to move. Right. I think a plan helps, certainly helps publicize things, if nothing else. Mm -hmm. um, interestingly, the, the plans are a really kind of a complicated thing, and it's generally a two-year process mm -hmm. from what I've seen. Mm -hmm. um, it, it might be able to be shortened, uh, but there's a, the big challenge is around uh, that baseline, um, actually understanding what's going on in the community. That's, that's the biggest challenge. It might be a little easier for us since we have the, the energy thing, or the electricity thing pretty well in hand. But then you have to uh, consider food and transportation and housing, and that, that's a pretty complex picture, but that's, that's what it would start with. So uh, I think that's something, I know there's interest in the Energy Board, uh, that's something we could certainly come back with a timeline on what that would look like for and, that And plan. if there, there would be a cost associated with it, you know, because, you know, a lot of folks here volunteer, but, you know, right. We, we've got to be realistic also to say that, I, I think uh, that's very true. I think in the end, a lot, there's a lot of opportunity realized savings, uh, certainly from a village perspective uh, with the, the efficiency opportunities. Um, but there is some real cost associated with creating an actionable plan. Yeah, and if, if, mm -hmm. you know, if you could bring that back to us also, because you know, it, it may take you, what, you said a couple years? The, to get the plan, get develop the plan, plan, and get a place right. to where you're actually taking action and moving ahead, that's a that's a pretty normal mm -hmm. timeline. Mm -hmm. But again, what we invest today could be a big savings tomorrow. Big savings. So there's a lot of things that we've already done. I mean, the biggest challenge that most communities face is around electricity. And we're, you know, I will say at least 80% of the way there. And, you know, and which is uh, pretty unique for a community that, that hasn't said, we've got these goals that we want to reach. We've just said, we know this is the right thing to do, so let's do it. And that's very commendable. In terms of the um, the flooding issue, are there near-term things that we can do? Um, it, I mean, I know some things like, I mean, just the water barrels, obviously, That's a, absolutely, can, yeah. can help because yeah. they can collect the water from roofs and things like that that would otherwise just go right into the river. I, I there think are that's certain very true. kinds of um, uh, landscaping that retains water, not in retention ponds usually, but it's a rain garden kind right. of thing. Right. There are, there are all kinds of things. Those are very uh, effective things that could be done, especially with new construction, um, because that's going to exacerbate the problem. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, and certainly anybody that is looking to retrofit, I know I'm looking at putting a retention basin, a recharge basin, and and because currently all of my water goes right into the creek and, and down the Little Miami ultimately. Mm -hmm. um, but there's really no reason why I couldn't just route that. I've got the space for it. I could just route mm -hmm. it over the, over my lawn and let it recharge 
down into the groundwater. Right. So that and that actually helps keep our aquifer strong. Mm -hmm. it does. Right. So the more we do on our little properties right. collectively, and th and that helps the us get to resiliency. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of things that that will really help those kind of those kind of strategies. Absolutely. I mean, this to me seems like a great topic for one of our work sessions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm also wondering, I mean, clearly Athens and, and Overland are probably the two communities that I think make the most sense, connect most to us. You know, I'm thinking maybe if we could even invite somebody from one of those two communities to come to our a work session when we get it on the agenda to, to talk about how their community implemented. Yeah, created, Overland, their, in created fact, this plan. is coming. To, I think Community Solutions is writing, inviting yeah. Overland to come, mm -hmm. and we right. talked about maybe trying to coordinate. Okay. But one thing that I think uh, Dewar didn't mention is uh, in regard to Yellow Springs, a lot of the plans are uh, developed at the top, and then maybe they sort of sit on the shelf. Yeah. Whereas in Yellow Springs, it's really yeah. bubbling up from the bottom. So we're actually doing things, all different groups and individuals and the village government and businesses, but we don't have the plan. So, I mean, that's a good thing. Right. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that's interesting is the way that you work a plan is you establish a baseline year. And we can actually establish our baseline year, say, uh, 2005, 2010, at some point in time when we hadn't done a lot of these things and said, okay, that was our baseline year, and now we're looking to achieve to get to this point. So. It would help, you know, help um, right. celebrate and bring to light the things that, that people have already done, including the village with electricity and the other things that have happened. And, sorry, well, Dewart, I was just going to say, uh, related to what Marianne's comment, even though the, uh, the action planning is a two-year process, it, it still involves doing things, right? And, and There's no reason things. we shouldn't do the things right. that we know are right now. Okay. I mean, absolutely. So another... Um, thing I'd like to see is collaboration between the Environmental Commission and the Resilience Network. I, I think that um, will help, you know, continue to develop this and bring in some of the capacity that the village doesn't have on its own. And is the is the Climate Action Group now the Resilience? Yeah, Okay, we've, so, we've, so we aren't talking about two different groups? Yeah. We've rebranded, yeah. so. Um, with the tagline. Yeah. I mean, what I'm thinking, <laughs> Council, is that I don't know when your next meeting is, is that, but that maybe it, at a future meeting, um, maybe the second meeting in May, Mary Ann can report back. You all, it, with Environmental Commission, can maybe put a little bit of a plan together, some sort of a schedule of when yeah. you would feel prepared to come back to Council. And the Energy Board's involved. Right, as well. okay. That, yeah. what, mm -hmm. yeah. So you're already That's collaborating, so cool. good. So, is yeah. that seem, yeah. is that good? Mm -hmm. Thank awesome. you all very much. That was great. Thank you. We, we encourage you. There's all kinds of great education going on. We encourage the community to come. There's a lot of events through Community Solutions, Green, Vir Green Environmental Coalition. Um, get involved and take personal action as well. Great. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Speaking of energy, our next report is um, from the Energy Board, and it's a report on community solar. And I see Dan is already standing I'm in already front here. of me. I'm already here. So uh, I don't have a PowerPoint this time because I already did the PowerPoint uh, last time represented. Um, but you've got the what I'm going to the little two-page thing. I'm going to go over real, real quickly. So just for those of you who don't know what community solar is, essentially community solar is enables people who don't have roof, rooftops or land suitable for solar panels to still be able to invest in and reap the rewards of solar panels installed in a suitable location. So someplace not on your roof. Um, and essentially what that requires is a virtual net metering ordinance. So it means that uh, a meter on the solar panels would be registering how much energy your panels generate and a meter on your house registers how much power you're using. The two of them are subtracted and you have virtual net metering. So in the, in the Energy Board's research on the different models of community solar, uh, there are three different kinds. There's uh, utility owned, um, a special purpose entity, and then in individually owned panels. And there are hybrids of all these that you can deal with. The utility owned uh, can be financed by a special purpose entity. Um, the uh, special purpose entity 
is an, an example of that is the Antioch Solar Array <coughs> where you have an investment group that financed it. They negotiated a power purchase agreement with Antioch over 25 years to buy the power back at that particular rate for the entire time. Um, looking at the first two, the village owned and the special purpose entity, um, utility owned means that the village would either have to come up with financing or money to actually buy the solar panels. And then typically in, a, in this type of thing, they sell shares in this, this solar panels to individuals. So the village would have to be in the business of selling those shares to be able to get the return on investment for that. And the village would, if it was financed through some kind of, of agreement with some financing entity, the village would have to sign on to buy the power at a certain rate, even if they didn't sell the interest in the panel. So we, we came down to at least for what the percentage of the set aside we have for solar and wind renewable energy production, the 5% that we talked about last time, 4% for large producers, 1% for small producers. We've got a portion of the 1% still available that the best model that would allow that to be utilized and essentially what we're recommending is just to use up the margin we've already set aside would be individually owned panels. Um, so that works well within the limited capacity somewhere between 100 and 200 kilowatt um, kilowatts of capacity and um, so my, my comment here is just remember we're not proposing any change at this point to the 4%, 1%. We'd like to come back and look at that and see whether or not there can be more margin in the village electric budget to be able to expand those. So why should we do it? Dewar uh, listed the, the reasons as far as climate change. Um, this may actual, actually save uh, the village money in the long run. Um, uh, Bob Brecka, who unfortunately had another commitment, so he had to leave earlier. He was here, here earlier in the uh, meeting, but did analysis of the hour by hour electric use and found that at least from his analysis and the data that he had, he had two years of electrical data, that 100 kilowatt in solar, additional 100 kilowatts of solar could save the village up to $8,000 on the peak energy rating. So, um, Theoretically, adding this is a positive thing as far as cost goes. Um, why should we do it relatively soon? The 30% uh, IRS solar tax credit expires in 2016. Um, one of the other comments I made last time, if we actually, uh, if, the, if somebody in the village or, or a developer installer did uh, 100 kilowatts or more of an installation, there are programs available for free batteries for an installation like that. The utility companies get a little bit of a tax break if they install uh, batteries along with a solar panel installation. And essentially what they do is they charge those batteries during non-peak times and then sell the energy back to the village during peak times at the premium rate. And that pays for the batteries. But the benefit of that for the village is uh, if you had this battery bank located next to a building, uh, it could be used during power outages to power an emergency shelter or something equivalent to that. And that's what they're typically put in. There would be no cost to the village for that. Um, serving uh, multiple people with one solar installation creates economy of six scale. I talked about all those things. Um, so on the second page, the next steps. The, so the next steps with this is uh, the village staff working with the energy board and John Courtney to try to come up with an uh, addendum to the present renewable energy ordinance. Um, when we were investigating this, we found there were all kinds of issues with the present ordinance as far as detailed things. Uh, we didn't define distinctly how the output of solar arrays that are presently installed or any future arrays are installed are actually rated. What is the output? Um, you know, we we require uh, Patty to uh, say that you can't install any more than the 5% altogether. We don't tell her exactly how to rate the, the panels that are installed. So that needs to be taken care of. Um, the energy usage of the village is going up over time, or at least changing over time. Uh, does the 4%, 1% change with it? We didn't really define that in, in the uh, present ordinance. Uh, 
we don't say what happens if you have new construction. If you want to put solar panels on your house for new construction, we define in the ordinance that you're supposed to take the, the, your average usage for the last year and that's the maximum amount of solar panels so we don't have people becoming large energy producers by putting huge arrays on their house. Well, what if you've got a new construction? We didn't define how that's done, so that needs to be done. Uh, we, we also didn't define lots of things as far as uh, what happens if somebody adds solar panels to an existing project? What happens if you don't get a permit? What happens if your renewable energy installation predates the ordinance? Um, so all those things need to be taken care of anyway in uh, addendums to the present ordinance because they were, unfortunately, the present ordinance was not fully thought through. To enable community solar, we'd have to add uh, virtual net metering as part of the ordinance. So essentially, this ability to have two meters interrelating, interrelated. Uh, in order to enable it with the present 4%, 1%, we have to, to find, it's, and it's somewhat ambiguous in the present ordinance, that um, a community solar installation is defined as a small producer if individually owned or small business owned sets of panels do not exceed the 25 kilowatts. And my comment on that was, just to address, we need to, there's some ambiguity in there in the, in the actual language of the ordinance. And if we're going to enable community solar, we have to say, okay, if you've got a large solar installation, it's put in by some XYZ company, but it's owned by 10 individuals, the individual panels, that, that each individual panel each person who owns those individual panels, that number should be used, not the overall array. Um, define the, the percentage of generated power of a virtual net metering installation that's credited to the owner of the panels and what percentage is credited to the village as a line charge. The Energy Board is cognizant that the village needs to maintain their energy grid. What we proposed as part of this and what we talked about throughout this is that if we, that, that we John Courtney is going to present, make a presentation next time that's going to outline what is the cost to maintain the electric grid. And it'd be re related to kilowatt hours. You know, what is the cost per kilowatt hour to maintain the electric grid? What we're proposing in community solar is that as part of the ordinance, we say, okay, this amount of the energy that you're generating through your solar panels located somewhere else goes to credit to you. The rest of it is, is goes to the village as a line charge, as a way of maintaining the grid. And that way, community solar does not reduce the ability of the village to function and, and maintain the grid. Um, it just provides a local, uh, local uh, resource. Um, and then the final thing was that uh, what we're proposing to offset to make sure that the village does, it doesn't cost any money to do this project is that part of the ordinance, the installer developer would be responsible for any cost involved with any needed software modification to, uh, to do this. And uh, we need to detail how that is done and, and some kind of format that, that would apply to, the, uh, to any software modifications needed. So essentially, that's it. I mean. Thanks, Dan. Council, questions, comments? Staff, I guess we need to hear from staff next. Yeah, I'd like to, uh, to, to see what Patty and Johnny might say in terms of giving us some advice. Well, I mean, um, as council's aware, Johnny and I have had some concerns um, with this since um, we became aware of it, and some of those have been answered um, throughout the process of meeting. Um, I, I was hoping that John Courtney would have um, available for us today a brief on the 23rd, I believe, of uh, March. Johnny and I met with AMP. Um, they brought just an updated presentation to us. And during the course of that, they um, started talking to us about a program that they have where they're installing community solar um, uh, facilities throughout different places, different states. 
So three days later, we met with John Courtney about the uh, preliminary rate proposal. We talked to him about it, and he said, yes, that's one way to do it, but there are other ways that um, we could potentially have our own array um, that didn't directly involve AMP, and therefore it would be owned by us. And he hoped to have that, the different um, models of that prepared for today, and unfortunately we don't have it in our packet, so he will be discussing that next week. Okay. He does feel that there is a way that we could potentially develop our own community solar and still be able to share, sell, um, share credits in it to the different um, residents who can't put solar panels on their homes for whatever reason. And um, Marianne and Rick and I talked a little bit about it after um, the energy board meeting the other night. Um, I really don't have a lot of information. Basic information is all I have right now. Um, you know, the big difference would be that the tax credits would not be available to the citizens. But, you know, the question is, do, do we care about the zero carbon footprint or do we care about the energy credits? And I'm sure that answer is different for different folks. And so, um, but the benefit to it would be, well, the village would own it. Um, and it would leave the, potentially leave the other residential um, allowance available for folks who could put it on their homes in the future. Um, and those are the things that John wants to address um, next week. Johnny, do you have anything that you want to? If you do, come up, please. I know that you had a safety concern that yeah well <clears throat> one of two of the issues that I have is not against solar I think solar is a good thing we just need to be able to own it or maintain it ourselves. Uh, just like last night we're out in a downpouring rain and if we have a community solar that's powering up a building it's putting back on a line potentially um, if we own it it can also be close enough to our substation to where we could possibly still run the power through our regulators so we don't have unclean power going out across the grid at a magnitude of what it's going to go at. Uh, we have regulators to regulate the power on this uh, the switching station. What Antioch produces on their system, they absorb 95% of it so we don't have a bunch of that but if you have a community solar that's located somewhere else and that's all going back on the grid and then it's a billing software program in here that sends it to the residents but we have to absorb that onto the grid with no regulators so I propose just like Patty we're talking with John, John Courtney and with AMP that we build it on our own and and maybe it's somewhere close to the uh, substation and we run it through our own regulators the other thing that does is is it allows the staff to know that it's going through the substation or through the switching station and we don't need to worry about it when we're on the lines in the downpouring rain or in the snow or in the heat of the day that we could potentially if we think it's grounded out and it's not then uh, I, I don't want to make that phone call. I've been in this field for 27 years, and I've yet to call a spouse of a wife and say, uh, I dropped safety. And, and the solar aspect of it, if you put into a transformer at a low voltage, you get the high voltage back out of it. It's, it, it works both ways. So if we put it in ourselves, would it, what, it we've, what about the set aside of the 4%, 1%? That could still remain the same, essentially. I mean, we wouldn't necessarily have to change that. The, the reason being, while we would be able to give, you know, sell credits to some of the residents, there would be a tipping point where we would say, okay, this helps us pay the system off, but it still keeps our revenues high enough to maintain our other contracts. The other thing that we talked about was, is if we own it, mm -hmm then uh, I, I'll just use John Young for instance. John Young wants to come in and he wants to buy from the solar field. Then when we 
enter his account, we would enter it in as a green account and he'd be charged X amount of dollars because he chose to buy from the solar field. So it would be, we would read his meter, it would go into a separate account and, and we wouldn't have to do this plus or minus whatever he produced or whatever he used at his house, we would just take it out of the solar field. So therefore, it wouldn't be a matter of adding or subtracting. It's whatever he uses as house, he gets credit for for the solar. Okay. Okay. So I this mean, is I, a lot of so yeah. I mean, I think that yeah. we'll just have to wait till next, right. till right. Monday it's, it's when, late. when right. John, yeah. I, I, well, I'd like to say, I, I mean, I think that uh, it makes sense to have locally produced renewable energy, mm -hmm. and uh, to start. Well, we've started doing that, I guess, with Antioch and with individuals. Um, I mean, we have to look at our finances. Mm -hmm. We don't want, but it makes sense to do that. Now, whether the village does it or whether it's a private company that does it with uh, individuals or whether it's both, I mean, we're not in a position to, we can't answer that question now. But I do think that it makes sense to bring that to the Energy Board because the Energy Board has that kind of expertise to look at the different models. The Energy Board didn't know until, well, th didn't know at all that there was the possibility of this other model right. that the I, village itself would. Actually, I, I can answer that. It, it is one of the models. It was one of the three models yes, that I put the there. Yeah. And, and it, it, it's a good model as long as the village is willing to commit to that. I mean, the, the understanding was that the village was not really willing to, to sign any more long-term contracts or, I mean, mm -hmm. potentially yes. 300000 to $500,000 plus to, to do a, a solar installation. But if, that, if that's not the case, then, then that, you know, it, it's fine. That's, that's a great way. You could do both ways. Um, you know, it, it, it's... You know, both of them are, yeah. they are good ideas. It, it, and in I, fairness to Dan, um, apparently there are some new models out there that are a little bit different from okay. from the ones that he's familiar with. So, I mean, it, and that's why John was going to write his his brief, his report. Mm -hmm. yeah, right. And I, I would like to say also that uh, you know solar panels and the idea of generating our own electricity is really sexy and it's a lot of fun, but I feel like especially after Deward's report. I mean, if you look around this community, we need investment in the existing real estate we have that isn't energy efficient. And it, it's, you know, I wish people would, would be putting some, some time, and I even worry about village, you know, I even think about village staff. You know, if we build our own solar field, you know, could we be putting those resources into a program for energy rebates. So, I mean, I really want people to be talking about that, too. I don't want to just be talking about the fun, sexy projects. I want to be talking about, because that deals with the affordability issue. It deals with, with our citizens' needs more so than, to me, the solar does. So, um, that's, you know, I guess in council, you know, I think that that's one of our values, but we've got to take responsibility for encouraging and, and staff and how we're going to get that onto the agenda. Um, so. Can I ask one other quick question? <coughs> uh, and, and I guess I can direct that to uh, Patty and mm -hmm. Johnny. Our, our present uh, ordinance or whatever, regardless, is it something we need to start looking at? Oh, it needs to be rewritten. Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. So do we, <laughs> I, think every, I think everybody agrees on okay. that. Is that something? Uh, John yeah. will help with that. Yeah. John Courtney. And, and we're actually, we're getting a few examples together okay. on how we can get, because okay. that's, it definitely needs to be rewritten, yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I, I'd, I'd like to see us move forward and in, in, in getting that document into something that's usable. Mm -hmm. Okay. Absolutely. I agree. Thank you all. And thanks, Dan. Thanks. 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 Thank you to the rest Dan. of the energy board thanks also. The board. Sorry to Bob that we are slow. <laughs> um, next item on the agenda is proposal for Channel 5 employee. I Will Patty be taking that? Um, I have it. Yes, I'm taking it if I can, if I can find my paper. Um, essentially, um, council is aware that um, Paul and Jean have decided that they're uh, going to maybe cut back on the, the many, many hours that they have been volunteering over the years. Um, thank you. 
and um, that we um, need to look for some way to um, to I'm, I'm not going to say replace because I'm, I don't think that's really possible hmm. um, but to uh, find someone to uh, assume their duties and um, to that end we started investigating different uh, possibilities and um, last month I think or earlier this month <coughs> at the uh, cap meeting a person came forward who used to volunteer at the station and said that they would potentially be interested in filling that position and that person would be Susan Gardner and um, I'm sure that you all know Susan and um, what was discussed briefly between her and myself and Brian on a Sunday <laughs> <laughs> or yep, a Saturday, a Saturday. Um, was a uh, Susan's not entirely sure that she really really wants to do this um, and so she asked for a temporary like short-term five-week um, contract at 20 hours a week um, and I believe $15 an hour Brian yes um, to um, to work the position uh, and assume the duties and at the end of that five weeks she would either say yes I am willing and able to do this permanently or she would say I'm not willing and able to do it permanently but here's what I see your needs to be to fill that position and so um, the recommendation that Brian and I have uh, essentially for um, council is that we uh, in fact enter into this short-term agreement and Chris was working on a contract um, I don't think he's quite there yet because we threw quite a bit of stuff at Chris last week, we'll have it later this week. and um, so if council wants to move forward with that um, it can come out of the um, the Time Warner money the Time Warner <laughs> money um, which goes into the general fund but you should be aware that um, if if we decide that this is how we want to move forward permanently um, that it we're gonna have to find we're gonna have to use general fund money to fund this position mm -hmm. um, if this is how we decide uh, to move and forward. The, the numbers you quoted if we if that were funded for a year that's fourteen thousand four hundred dollars mm -hmm. for the salary mm -hmm. Um, what would be the benefits on top of that would there be um, no this person would be a contract employee there would be no benefits um, and they would be responsible for their own taxes and things and one of the issues we talked about is a lot of the work can be done remotely right mm -hmm. so that uh, plays a factor um, yeah I also want to highlight you know Susan actually volunteered from the state for the station from 2005 to 2011 so she brings a lot of experience and the thing I think really she brought to our attention is that we probably don't have enough data to really figure out what right. this entails so having somebody to come in and, and do that work um, means that we can make a better decision are we allowed to do that kind of contract it seemed to me that a few years ago we we the, the we, there was stuff from the state that said you can't the remote is the key the fact oh. that she can do it remotely um, oh, if, sorry. yeah if, uh, if there's a, a lot of the percentage of, right. of mm -hmm. oh, if they're okay. primarily here they can't right. it can't be a contract right because they're okay. an employee right but, all right so I'll let you I I'm certainly supportive of it it's certainly of Susan of I have a lot of experience with Susan and I think she, it would be a great first step Mm -hmm. to gather data yeah this one quick question Patty you were saying that you know we could use Time Warner funds this year mm -hmm. but in the future well, I mean, well, those I mean, funds are going in the general yeah, fund so right you, it, you yeah, can use general at, fund money yeah. you can use them every year we okay. make about thirty two thousand okay. dollars off the franchise okay. but the fact of the matter is that that's general fund money that is okay. currently used yeah. for other things okay, yeah. okay. Um, so council are we directing Patty to um, draw up a contract Chris is working on a contract and we're all supportive okay great yeah. thank you um, next is the roles and responsibilities document discussion I will turn that over to council members Housh and McQueen okay um, so this is the um, well we've looked at this document which is one page with 
an attachment which is called public service values for local government officials um, we have council looked at this more than once it's been to the commissions um, there was some concern on the um, HRC in particular about some of the wording uh, which was removed um, that wording said something about uh, well the term respect profession respect at, respectfully professionally and something else that was that term was removed and instead the last bullet says uphold the public service values for local elected officials articulated by the Institute for local self-government and then there's one page of values uh, which there are a couple things actually that should probably change because it references elected officials which commissioners are not um, but basically I think the that that statement of values is very informative and I would suggest that the last phrase of that sentence which says even when disagreeing with a particular council decision or action by village staff be omitted because that is addressed in the value statement the other thing um, that uh, when the, the last HRC meeting people some people were concerned about was the idea of signing this document um, to me that's not a critical thing the critical thing is that people see this and they say yeah I'm behind this I agree with this so I, I would be fine with and I think actually people said they'd be happy to initial it or something so mm -hmm. I don't see that as a, it's not an issue for me so, I'm so done. I mean you sign it or initial it you're here you know, <laughs> what to me I don't see much a difference between the, the signature and an initial so uh, there is a, yeah. Yeah. You, uh, are you wanted to? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I. Um, well, Chris, I is yeah. Do you want to? I mean, from. Mm -hmm. I would like to hear from Chris yeah. uh, from a legal and perspective, then, well, and then from well, citizens. Yeah. Now. Yeah. 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 Um, the uh, let me just make a couple preliminary comments, and then I'll address the initials versus signature. Um, the it seems to me that the question is is that you, when you pose it to the legal counsel is what are the legalities of the document um, there's no bright line here there's no yes or no um, this discussion began with a, a, a belief that civility was an important value to promote within the context of the committees um, I say this from my own personal experience on boards that I've served on. I found it helpful when there were documents in place that told me what the expectations were of what um, I was uh, what I was entering into. So I think that the document does have an explanatory component to it, which provides some value. Um, from a legal standpoint, uh, I like the fact that um, that it says that if you take on the role of serving on a, on a board or one of the commissions that you don't have the capacity to represent the village I like that from as a lawyer because I think that what happens sometimes is that when somebody takes on a commission role that people want to influence those folks because they have the ability to advise counsel and I think that there's sometimes a a, a belief um, more likely than not in an unintended one that uh, there's some con you know import to, to being and serving um, other than just the, the the public service aspect which obviously is commendable when people are volunteering their time um, and energies uh, the last part is is that kind of gets to this initial uh, initial issue is that you know in my view and I whether it's an initial whether it's a signature all that really is a reflection of there's a that one has read the document and has acknowledged what it says um, is it a requirement I don't know I understand the the position that some folks have that, that signing some type of document is it could be interpreted as a as an attempt to chill one's speech uh, but I, I don't think that that's 
the intent. Council's clearly said that's not the intent that's reflected in the minutes of, of council. Um, it's simply trying to promote a, a value. Um, at least that's what council said that it is, and there's no reason not to take that at face value. So in the context of a what I would call a best practice, and lawyers advise clients based upon best practices, I think that this document reflects a best practice. I think that it's uh, based upon the research that was done. Uh, we learned that there were other, well, I should say Brian learned that there were other communities that have done this. Um, and it seems to have worked in those communities, again, without any negative consequence, although I candidly, I can't tell you that I've looked into that. I assume that it hasn't happened because there would have been a report back on that. So uh, what I would say is whether council adopts this or not, um, it's not a make or break thing. It's not really a legal question. It really is a, a, a reflection of what council would like to do in the context of how council would, the currently com comprised council, would want their committees to operate and how they want them to function. And does this document give the guidance that's necessary to allow those bodies to function in the roles that the charter and the ordinances contemplate that they do it? Chris, I have, I have a question on the conflict of interest paragraph, clause, whatever. Um, the words or appear to benefit are in parentheses. I would like to strike that. Is there any reason? I, I, I think that's way too, I think that's. Um, it's too vague. It's too vague. Well, I mean, I. Is that in, is that in the, the bullet point? Bullet, or yeah, is that in the bullet, bullet, bullet points. I mean, I mean. Conflict of interest is pretty clear that, that there has mm -hmm. to be a financial benefit. Yes. Individual people can choose, can say, hey, I feel like maybe there is an appearance of um, conflict, so I will recuse myself, but I don't think the appearance of a benefit should be. Um, Especially because, it, yeah, it's in the eyes of the right. holder. So I, I would just ask. I, I, I only ask I don't have an objection to that. I mean, I think that, that much like the, the, the reference to the Sunshine Law, that if someone has a conflict and they have any questions, that there's resources that they can right. use okay. to get an answer to the question. Um, so I don't think there's an issue with that. Okay. Any counsel, before we hear from citizens, do we have any other questions well, for Chris? I, yeah. You still didn't ask my question. Okay. What? In other words, if if the signature signature or initials in material, should we have a signature block on here and ask people to sign it or or not? I mean, I don't I don't I don't want you know to take it to to my group and and say we need you to sign it and Brian takes it to his group and says, well, you can sign it if you want to. You know, that's what you know. If there's, a, if there's an initialing or a signature, I would take the position that it has the same impact. Okay. Okay. I would That's want I would want one, one or the other. Okay. And, and right. okay. Well, could, we, could we add a, because you said that by signing or initialing, you're just acknowledging. Let's read and acknowledge, yes. I have read and acknowledged. Mm -hmm. by, could we add a line that just says something like, by signing this document, I I acknowledge that I have received and and read this information. Yeah. That yeah. limits. Right. That says exactly what you're doing. You're signing mm -hmm. to say I've read this mm -hmm. and I understand mm -hmm. it. Yeah. And it, it acknowledges. So. Yeah. I think if we had that, then it it's le it's more clear what we're at, what what the signature means. Um, and I think that's been some of the anxiety. Yeah, I, I think that's, I mean, that's definitely something that was talked about early on, and I think that's a good addition mm -hmm. if, if that. I, I think it makes sense. Again, I, to, to me is that, that there's all, there's sometimes there's just some vagueness of when mm -hmm. one serves on these boards or commissions, and to clear up that ambiguity so people understand better, I think that's always a, a, a positive thing. Yeah. So by signing, I acknowledge that I've read and understand my roles and responsibilities. I as just a I read and understand this document. Read, read, yeah. be read and acknowledged, okay. and then have it be underneath the signature line. Mm -hmm. Can I still clarify something? Sure, of course. Um, Kate Hamilton. I know it sounded like it was a big joke, but we didn't say just put our initials. We said to have a checklist that says we have completed, and I think this is important too, um, the Sunshine Law certification check next you know put our initials next to that we have read 
the rules and regulations, put our initials next to that, and other things that um, make sense for a commission. Because I don't even know where Section A came from. Like, I checked the website that you listed, and it's a dead website. And I looked up Institute for Local Self-Government, and it doesn't, like, exist. So, I mean, and the first draft of this looked like a mimeograph from like a 1980s book. And it's not that we don't like what it says, it's just I'm not going to sign something. That's a legally binding thing and the, it's very vague, all of it's very vague. And I would expect that you wouldn't expect us to do things that you don't. Um, and I, I don't know, you just can't always make everything homogenous, it doesn't always work. And I did have a chance to talk to the executive director of the Dayton Human Relations Council and asked her how they handle these types of things. I wanted to also get her input on, on other issues that have been brought to us to see if their HRC handles those things. Um, and of course, they're huge compared to us. And they have 10 volunteers. They swear them in. They don't sign anything. She said that is not common at all. I don't know if you're looking at other committees or specifically human relations commissions. Uh, she said even the city workers in Dayton don't sign anything. She said they, she didn't even know if they did much with the um, Sunshine Law. Um, and another thing about representing HRC or representing the village, we, I have personally been told that I represent the village 24-7. And I don't agree to that. And I didn't sign on for that. I feel that... And I don't even know what you mean by the village. That sounds like a corporation rather than w where, a community. Where is, the, where is that line? That's not from? in here. It's just what I have been told. Some of our HRC meetings covered a lot of this stuff. And that was very inferred to me. And then there was the policy about um, online issues. And Patty and Brian sent me that policy as well, mm -hmm. that all committee members are under that. and. So, no, I don't want to represent the village 24-7, just at certain events, or if someone asks me, you know, if we can do something as HRC, I will say I'll look into it or whatever, but I don't take that liberty at all. So, it's just, it's just on signing things. Signing Thanks, things Kate. is legal. And there is an institute for local government. I'm on their website. Yes. And maybe it's the... It, the self-government. It's local government. It's local government. Local, uh, local government, yeah. So probably the self was a. Yes, Sue. So. I'm Sue Abendroth, and I have a question about the fiduciary liability of commission members. Do they suffer any uh, liability for their service as a commissioner? Can they be sued as individuals, or if they misbehave, is the village available to be sued? And issues like that, I've not seen any reference to that kind of concern, but I know council has legal representation if they need it. Do the uh, commission members have the same representation available to them, or do they not? That's what I want to know. When Chris gets back, I'm, I'm, oh. Thank God. You couldn't see it. I just thought I'd see you. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you're in the blind spot. What Kate was um, to, so. the, the answer is, I, one, I, 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 I asked, posed this question to council. I'm unaware of any committee member being sued. Frankly, it would be more likely in the context of the BZA or the Planning Commission because they actually have quasi-judicial power. Um, and Patty, raise your hand. Yeah. Actually, that's what Kate was <coughs> referring to. We checked with the um, liability insurance company, and they said that if a commission member were sued and named as a commission member for the village, that the village would have uh, the responsibility to defend them. So. And one would think that they would fall, that would fall under the, the individual committee members would have, commission members would have qualified immunity as well if acting within the capacity, yeah, official capacity on behalf of the village. Right. I mean, your it's not, it, if from a liability exposure standpoint, it's not uh -huh. one that I would consider to have any real consequence. I, 
And again, it, it's, just, it's never happened. I cannot imagine. Well, I can imagine, but I just don't think it's realistic that, that it would it would happen. But there is protection. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what are we going to do with this council? Um, well, I do suggest the addition of that line. Um, I hear Kate. I hear your your concerns. Um, I think if we make it clear that what you're doing is you're signing, acknowledging that you received this, the so you, the submission of the certificate of completion is what indicates that you've done everything else, and um, uh, I I I I think that indicates exactly the purpose of the signature and that it is only to say I got this and I've I've read it I acknowledge it it doesn't hold you to anything else and um, there's nothing on here that says the 24 hour, 24 hour a day the only thing that does in a way apply to is that if a bunch of if we all get onto a Facebook thread and we're all commenting we've created a public meeting and it's a violation of Sunshine Law and we have had problems with various committees violating Sunshine Laws so to, to that degree you are kind of if you're talking about the policies that are before the HRC in a public forum of any kind with a lot of other members it you are representing the village at that point but there's nothing on here that says you're here 20 24 7 as far mm -hmm. as I know and really all we're saying is you acknowledge that you've read this and uh, and re you've re received and read this, this list so I, I I heard your concerns and I feel like I think with that additional line I, I, I think they've been pretty much addressed yeah I mean I'm assuming that the statement that that inference came from was attributed to me but I can I can say with confidence and we've videoed some of our meetings we could go back that I mean certainly if any co commission member holds themselves out you know in that capacity then it's going to be perceived as representing the village um, and so if there was a misunderstanding created that shouldn't be the case and, and Chris I do want to I do want to follow up on on Lori's comment about um, sunshine law um, because there has very recently been um, social media posts that that included several members of, of a commission um, commenting on social media that is a violation of sunshine law correct yeah. a majority of members uh, yeah, exactly I mean the, in today's world you, I mean when sunshine law was first contemplated the transparent government it, it by definition essentially meant you had to be together mm -hmm. it doesn't anymore um, technology has changed that um, I also want to point out on this issue of the, the representative capacity uh, it, it's it's having special power as an individual commission uh, commission member so it's suggesting that somehow I have some power to influence um, that, that's a little different so uh, it, that that's that's the concern and, and sometimes I don't think that it's happened here but individuals in certain communities do often hold themselves out or have held themselves out to have some type of influence and that's what we want to avoid because that's not what good government and transparent government's about but I think the social media piece is an issue because yes. that is happening in on personal time yes not related directly to Commission work but it's happening yes okay Chrissy but before Chris Chrissy saying uh, again, you know, we we as council, and if we adopt this, you know, we appoint folks to the commissions, okay, and by either signing or initialing, they agree to adhere to this, or they acknowledge it. Now, if they decide they can't do that, then to me they're saying, I can't serve on this commission under these guidelines and they would ask to be uh, uh, removed from the commission am, am I correct that's a fair interpretation yeah, so yes. I mean each individual now will have to take a look at that and you know and and make that that choice uh, given you know 
do I want it to continue to serve? I think that that's a discussion okay. that we need to be having. That, yes. that they need to have with themselves and then decide. And then we as a commission will then determine if we have enough or we have to go and get more and so forth. But, uh, you know, I, I think it's, uh, it, it now becomes a, a personal decision. Chrissy. Well, that was kind of what I was going to ask because when we first started discussing this document in HRC and we specifically asked, well, what happens if we don't sign? And Brian said, well, then quite possibly you would not be able to serve on the commission. And I said, well, what about people like me and Kate? We've already been on the commission and when I first got seated on the commission, I wasn't required to sign this. So now you're going to come back and say, you got to sign this, and what if I don't? And he said probably we would be um, lose our seat on the commission. So now, if the signature is not all that important, it, signing this document, that was what I was going to ask. What if somebody doesn't want to sign it? And I don't really think that signing this document is going to change anybody's attitude about being on a commission. I think that's the job of the people that interview people for the commissions to see if they're capable of upholding this and signing a piece of paper saying that I'm going to do it it's so kindergarten and I don't think it's like I said I don't think it's going to change anything it's passing the buck either you pick people for your commissions that are going to buy by these standards or you don't making them read a piece of paper and sign it it's not like I'm going to say oh wow yeah I didn't realize I was, I was going to have to go to every meeting it's just common sense, and that's your job in picking people for commissions. I don't think I would sign something like this myself. Thanks. Um, well, I guess I want to clarify again. Um, what I know I said in response to that question is that we had not talked about that at council table yet, so, um, so I wouldn't have said that that was what was going to happen. And subsequently, actually, at this meeting, after talking to Chris, uh, we talked about the fact that it wasn't about uh, removing anyone from a commission. I think what Jerry's talking about is a little bit different in that should somebody, you know, remove themselves if they feel uncomfortable uh, because they feel that this is in some way limiting their capacity to advocate as a citizen because that line is blurred with their role as a commission member. I guess I'd like to respond to what Chrissy said. Um, I, I don't. Uh, yeah, uh, council members have a role when we interview, and we we maybe need to tighten that up. I think we do. I mean, there's some whole things about how whether the commission knows that there's a vacancy, and there are things that we're in the process of trying to tighten things up. But I don't think this is kindergartening, really. This is this means that if I'm going to be on a commission, I'm going to read it. Not everyone has that. Not everyone necessarily comes to, not everyone necessarily just automatically makes a commitment, for example, to come to a meeting. And this, this means that people who are going to be on a commission read this and go, okay, yeah, yay or nay, or oh, I have questions about it. But I, I think it, we're trying to get just sort of like this thing, the loopholes that, that we're finding we're in the uh, utility thing, that we're trying to standardize. This is part of that, I think. So are we ready to bring this? At, I, I guess would this need to be passed as, uh, we'll take Paul and, and thanks, Jessica. Paul Avendroth, very quickly. I think this document describes the expectations that council and the citizens have of people that serve on boards and commissions. And you can approach it either of two ways. Have the members swear to do it, or the council members representing that committee can remove people who don't meet those standards. And I think that's your job if you don't have a commitment by the person. It's your job to make sure that the, the members of those boards and commissions uh, uphold those standards. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Jessica. And, um, State Je your name, please. Jessica Thomas. Um, when I was reading through this document and like listening to some of the conversation back and forth, what really concerns me about it is that usually, like, I, I sign a contract for teaching. I'm a teacher, 
And with my contract, there's, there's my roles and responsibility, but there's also a list of consequences if I don't meet those things. These consequences are not clarified in this document, and if there is any progressive discipline, it needs to be stated ahead of time so that it's not, oh, well, this commission is doing this, this commission is doing that, whatever. If it's going to be a standard document across all the commissions and you're going to adopt it for new commission members, um, I know that it had been mentioned at an HRC meeting about members that are currently serving being grandfathered in, lots of questions about that, but you need to outline all everything before you have people even initialing it because looking at it as is, I know that I wouldn't be able to follow all of those things. I know that I've seen council members at the Gulch, things like that, and where it's where does it say that council members well no 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 I'm can't saying go to the Gulch no I'm saying like when we're talking about violating sunshine laws, if you have you mentioned Facebook, I know that I've seen council members out at places in groups of three or more. That's all I'm saying, is that it's, it's very easy to violate these things. And if we are going to have a document that outlines rules and regulations, we need to make sure that we have consequences ahead of time so that there is no vagueness in it. Thank you. Okay. I want to clarify something. The Sunshine Rule violation isn't the gathering of three or more people of the body. It's the discussion of public business. So you can go wherever you want. You can be on Facebook. You just can't be on Facebook with three other members or however many HRC members talking about HRC matters. That's what makes it a sunshine law violation. So mm -hmm. I just want to clear up that misunderstanding. Yeah. So, okay. and as what I comes? said, this is not like a, a contract, especially with the added line. It's not a contract that you're signing for your work and for your livelihood. It is, I have read and I understand the, the expectations of 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 what I've just what I've just taken on. That's all. I've read it. I understand it. That's all you're saying. Um, obviously, you know, if people are egregiously violating these things, and yes, they we they you serve at the pleasure of council. We can we can tell people to leave any time we want with a majority vote. Patty, we can tell we can fire Patty with a majority vote. Right? Any time, because she serves at the pleasure of council. That's that's all that that's that's already there. That this isn't that isn't even a part of this. All this says is I I somebody has actually given in writing what the basic expectations are. I've read it. I've seen it. That's all you're that's all you're saying with your signature. If it said I've read it and I've seen this, that's not what it says. That's the, the line that I just said uh, needed okay, to be added. Well, yeah. well right. let's, let's summarize. Let's, we'll summarize. Yeah. What would you two like to see? So, I, do, you, do we want to package these two issues or do we want to bring this back? Does this need to be passed with legislation, Chris? I don't believe it does. Yeah. And yeah. I think that you can just make a motion here we and say this is this document we want to use. Roles and responsibilities. We don't okay. never so, a resolution. So let's summarize. Bullet point four: We've removed the words or appear to benefit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The last bullet point: We're putting a period after attachment C attachment A, and we are also removing self by the Institute for Local Government. We're adding a bullet point that says by signing. I not, not even a bullet point. I would. I would. Oh, okay. Okay. Just okay. Straight, line. Just straight line. Pull it down. Yeah, pull down the signature line. By signing, I acknowledge that I have read that read and understand this document. Is that? Mm -hmm. So do you, do we have that all? Yeah. Okay. I have it written down. If you guys. No, I was just I had done that signature line a little bit a little bit differently, but I, I'm what? fine with that. By signing, I understand I have read. I acknowledge. I, by, I acknowledge I have read and understand this document. That's I think that's fine. Okay. Okay. So. So um, I'm, I move that we uh, accept the document as amended. I'll second that. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Thank you. 
Uh, now we're moving on to new business solid waste contract information. Is that something that can oh, hold? Yes, yes. I'm sorry, yes. That I it wasn't even that. on the. It wasn't, okay. and I oh, didn't okay. even get to it. Right. Um, can we do quick manager and assistant manager right. and clerk reports? I'm going to skip over the things we've already covered. Um, there were some, uh, I want to give two shouts out to some of the crews. Um, as you saw in your packet, there's some pictures from the uh, stormwater line that Jason's crew, um, streets crew put in on Davis Street, uh, which is what we had the thank you note for, and that was a great job. And also to Johnny's crew for being out for two hours in the rain last night and getting the power back on for everybody. It was an interesting time. Um, Joe continues to work on the CCR, and that will be in um, go out with the June bills. The soil boings are complete, and we're moving forward with the 30% uh, design on the water plant. John Courtney will be here next week. Um, we've already talked about the cable access station manager and the beaver flow uh, device. Um, we need to talk about the skate park steps. Um, there was yes. a brief in your packets about it um, mm -hmm. and the reasons for putting them back in. Um, and it is a recommendation of the uh, staff that they do go back in. So I'd like to know how council yes. Mary Ann's yeah. got yes. thumbs up. Yes. Yes. I'm, yes. Yeah. yes. yes. All right. we Very big great. thumbs up. Um, I, can, I, I would love that whole hillside to be addressed, but I won't. Uh, well, sorry. Yeah, unfortunately, <laughs> there are big one. stumps and rocks in I there, know. but we're thinking about hiring the goats to come in and eat the vegetation <laughs> off it. Uh, seriously. No, goats are great for goats that. Goats are great. <laughs> so um, don't forget that uh, Home Inc. is working on cleaning up C Street a little bit, and they are having an open house up there May 1st from 530 to 730. Durst Brothers will be up there hopefully getting that part done um, as soon as uh, the weather allows them. They should be starting on the new library roof very soon. Uh, pool passes are getting ready to go on sale. The one thing that I would like to uh, point out, um, in the past there's been a general, um, a general, I'm going to say policy for lack of a better word, um, where if someone shows up at the pool and they don't have their pool pass and they say, but you know, I have one, um, they've been allowed to go into the pool without paying the, the daily fee, um, which is all fine and good, except for the Dayton pool management doesn't know our residents. And there have been several instances of them letting people in who are not residents and didn't have pool passes. So we are going to be enforcing that this year. And it is important that uh, folks understand that if you are coming to the pool, please bring your pool pass. Please, it's going to be the little ones that get pinned on your swimsuits, uh, and so it will not be a, a big horrible deal to pin that on. Um, I would like to note that the Montessori School is having a bike-a-thon on May 8th. Uh, it's a fundraiser for St. Jude's, not for the Montessori School, so um, if you would like to sponsor somebody, uh, please look into that. I think Malachi might be uh, writing. So, yeah. um, huh. and Two things on a personal note, as of 5.30 today, I only own one house. Oh. Oh. <laughs> yes. And uh, actually one and a half, because we still have Mike's mom's house, but we have a contract on it. Um, and the last thing is I uh, have committed to doing the Susan G. Komen three-day uh, for Cure again this year um, in November in San Diego. I will be training. Um, my schedule is a little bit up and down. Um, so if I'm out walking at odd times of the day, um, I will <laughs> work it around my schedule as best as I can. And Brian has agreed to be my primary fundraiser. Um, oh. I am hoping to raise the most money of anybody in that walk because then I get a bigger tent. <laughs> so, so the pressure's on. The pressure's on. <laughs> so, a bigger um, tent, yeah. Yes. <laughs> And that's all I have. <laughs> all right, ready? Yep. Okay. I'm going to go through this pretty quickly. Uh, Planning Commission met on April 13th uh, and discussed several items. Uh, 104 Zini Avenue, where Peaches is at, was uh, Planning Commission uh, voted to recommend uh, approval to the Village Council for that from uh, C Conservation to uh, B1 Central Business. We have Gateway Overlay. Uh, that ordinance will be presented at our next council meeting in May. 
Uh, they also heard two requests from Antioch College to, re to vacate street right-of-ways. Uh, one uh, East Herman Street was tabled by the commission. Uh, and they have asked staff for more information regarding the uh, utility easements, runoff requirements from the EPA, and uh, expansion of the cul-de-sac and Herman for fire trucks. Uh, however, they did approve the East North College um, right away vacation with conditions, uh, which we're working on with our, our uh, the village solicitor's department uh, and drafting the um, the documentation for that, and also the agreement with Antioch College on maintaining uh, the easement and some of those finer details. So that will be uh, brought to you guys in May as well. Uh, permit fees, we already went over that, and a minor subdivision was approved. Uh, for 1126 Livermore. So that was Planning Commission. Uh, ICMFLs are coming in May 2nd. Uh, we are working, uh, we're finalizing some housing situation with them, which is which is a, a good step forward here. And then we're also finalizing the calendar this week and uh, getting the tour set up. And uh, <coughs> Councilmember Housh and Caba and I met this morning to talk about how they're coming, uh, what our expectations are and uh, preparing for their arrival. So that's that's happening. And then uh, finally, no, go, ahead. go ahead. Oh, finally, I'm working, still working on a sidewalk report. I've pulled a lot of council meeting minutes from late 2010, early 2011. And uh, I have an entire folder of emails from villagers uh, from that era as well that I'm going through. And uh, I'm looking at case studies. I've, I've looked at uh, a lot of examples across the country. Uh, so hopefully I'll be able to condense this all into a format that you guys can read. Uh, and we can t discuss in, May, in, in late May. So uh, do you have any questions? Uh, will we be doing like a press release on the ICMA fellows who are coming in? Uh, we, sh we should, yes. We should do that. Yeah, I think we're probably at that stage. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, so John and I will collaborate on and that. Send that to me and I'll send it to you. Yeah, great. Um, do, um, well, I guess you'll send it to Sharon and... Yes. Uh, um, um, and, and maybe we should mention that the, what John briefly touched on about the housing. Um, we, we were trying to find some place to house them together um, for most of the period of time. We've been unable to do that. So if anybody has an idea of uh, where uh, these two ICMA fellows could stay together for three of the four for, weeks, yeah, because I know that they're the first three weeks. Maria, Mariana's mm -hmm. is uh, housing them at the village guest house for the last yeah. uh, week. Um, the, we prefer to keep them together. We've been unable to do that. We, we believe we have two places for them to stay individually. Um, they do get a stipend um, for their stay, and that would be available to help compensate for that. So please, if you have any ideas about that, contact John or Brian. And the only requirements is that it would be a furnished uh, place and that there's no pets. Correct. Thank you. Um, what, what is the welcome dinner on the second? Or it, who's that? You know, we uh, we aren't sure when they're getting in. We still don't have their flight schedule. So uh, at a minimum, it'll be something that maybe I will host. Uh, so a small gathering that anyone wants to come to, and I'll, I will cook halal. Um, but if we know soon, we may be able to plan something more. Yes. We just we don't know if they're coming in morning, evening. It could so, be a welcome breakfast. Yes. <laughs> Um, yeah, and I do want to highlight again, Mary Ann has offered um, the guest house uh, at, for free to meet our commitment mm -hmm. um, uh, on the village end, which is really great. Thanks, Mary Ann. Okay, is that it, John? That's mm -hmm. it. Okay, thank you. Um, Judy? You know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to not read this because you guys are going to talk about me later. Well, mm -hmm. I have a feeling we... Maybe asking, we may def be deferring that to the to the next well, meeting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think we can defer some idea. more. Yeah, yeah, sorry, we'll take care of you. It's no I mean, it's just goals, and they're out there, and they're that, and, and they they're look excellent. Great, yeah. great. excellent. Um, okay, let's. Can we go through standing reports quickly? Yeah, I didn't go to either of mine, so. <laughs> That's why. Right. I, I guess Planning Commission, we've already John covered. John already talked about Planning Commission. Uh, Melissa talked about finance. Uh, mediation is, is continuing on. Um, Patty and I, uh, and we won't take the time tonight, but we need to discuss uh, the library. Uh, there, there are 
more repairs that, that need to be made need to be made a request to be made so we we, we need to uh, uh, I'm going to meet with Patty first, and, and then we'll bring it to council as to uh, what we see the future of, of that building. Uh, and then on, on community resources, uh, they have uh, requested that all ex officio members not come to the next couple of meetings. Not sure what the reasoning and so forth is, but... Uh, they have asked that that we not attend the next couple of meetings. So, uh, just give you a heads up on that. Uh, I asked for some more clarification, and if I get it, I'll pass it on. If not, then to me, council acts accordingly as it relates to community resources. Brian. Okay. Uh, Charter view committee. Uh, all of the only update is we are on schedule to present uh, at our June first meeting and uh, have those amendments ready with a report. So that's going great. Um, our village solicitors have been very actively involved and helpful. Uh, regarding HRC, uh, I, I should mention that at our last meeting, I announced that I will be passing the torch as council liaison. Mary Ann's taking that over. Um, primary reasons are two of my, my other two commissions currently have council goals that keep me very busy and I plan to spend the next two and a half years focusing on our economic development initiatives. So I needed to think about time. Um, but uh, I did want to mention that the HRC has agreed to form a welcoming committee to help with our international fellows, which I think is great. Um, and in terms of the Public Art Commission, the motorcycle noise signage uh, document is in our packets uh, basically to see if we agree with this kind of messaging and are willing for Patty to take it forward to explore signing uh, signage options, what the costs might look like and that sort of thing. Um, so, so we're suggesting that these signs are going on private property, so the village is going to so, so it's have it's, signs made for yeah. Private so property. it's it's voluntary. Uh, so we we have said, or I guess part of the suggestion has been that the village would create the signs. We'd look at you know what's most cost effective, and then uh, we have one of the venues that has agreed to post a sign. Chris, is there any issue with that, with us creating signs that would go on private property that aren't um, well, they agree to it. I mean, well, we're not forced to yeah. ask to ask motorcyclists to not throttle, to keep to throttle down when they go through town, and to not rev up when they take off. I think in the context of public service announcements, I don't think there's an issue. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Brian. Did you get an email about that today from? A person whose name doesn't want to be said but rides a motorcycle? No. Okay. Um, this person contacted me and was concerned that um, it may actually increase the throttling um, because there is actually a campaign um, that to put loud pipes on your bike because it's a safety thing because more people hear you coming and they were concerned that that might be it. They, they were gonna send you an email today and I'll, mm -hmm. I'll check and see why they didn't. But um, the concern was that it may actually encourage people to rev more. I mm -hmm. mean, I know that it's been a discussion at PAC for a while. Right. But I, I mean, to me, the issue is that those, the, the people who are gonna read those signs are stopping and, and going to our biz, those businesses and I think that's different than people just riding through town. Mm -hmm. And I think it may have a different impact. I, did right. you think that? I do. I mean, I you know, this all started. We were you know contacted by one citizen in particular, but several others came. Uh, we heard from uh, motorcycle riders, and this was based on some of the language that they thought would be clever enough that people would notice it. Um, I okay. guess I agree that it's it's worth trying, and especially if you know Peaches in particular has said we are happy to post a sign. Um, okay. That that says something to me. Okay. Thanks, Brian. Marianne. So I've submitted a written report for my three commissions. 
So, um, and I uh, want to know whether um, any council member has any questions, concerns, etc., about the well, the goals that or the actions that that, that the commissions are doing. No, the I would. Energy I would commission the energy board and the mm -hmm. environmental commission. Mm -hmm. No. Yeah, I well, think it looks that great. That was really nice of you to yeah. write it all out like that. Um, <laughs> and the dashboard project, um, Rick Walkie had a meeting with Antioch College today, but I had hoped to be able to give a little more information about that. I, has that been talked about at council at all? I don't remember it. So just briefly, um, Oberlin uh, has, has done this. You, there are these screens that, um, like I think they have in their school and their college and downtown, that shows in real time the electric use for their village, the water use. I think there's some other things. So it's a, it's, it's sort of getting to what Karen you were talking about. I think in terms of having people go, oh my word, we're using all. And 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 then schools can or uh, different neighborhoods or whatever could sort of vie against each other. Like, okay. can we reduce our energy? So that's what the day sounds good. Bring it to meeting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, the last thing I have about the drug task force discussion. I mean, it's like quarter to eleven. So why not? Can we call it the ACE task force, yes. which is the proper name yes. for it? But I'm very interested in having a really good discussion that doesn't get into just yay or nay. And if there's another council member that would like to talk with me about uh, coming back with a proposal, I'd be happy to do that. I'm happy to work okay. on it. Okay. Of well, course. We can do that on our okay. Yeah. And uh, since we, I, I should have mentioned because we didn't get to the community access panel, but Cabba Davies was here tonight filming uh, for four hours. And uh, <laughs> She is going to be working primarily with Channel 5, um, but also with our international fellows. John mentioned that before, and with the HRC. And today was her first day. So. Oh, great. <laughs> um, I did attend the Greene County Regional Planning Commission meeting, and um, it is, I really don't know where they're going to go on whether they're going to stay as a Regional Planning Commission or whether it's going to go under Greene County. Um, what was discovered is that ORC literally puts full control of that um, board with the county commissioners. Yeah. So the county commissioners are three members of that board and they appoint every other member yeah. of that board. Yeah. That scares me. Yep. Unfortunately, and I, I pretty much said that to Tom Kugler sitting across the table from me. and. Um, Problem is, as I don't know how Green County Regional Planning is going to fund themselves. They don't have enough money to operate. So I don't know what's going to happen. Um, the Chamber, we had a great um, Shred It Day. The sat past Saturday was Shred It Day at the Glen. The Glen did a great job. Tons of, um, tons of computers. We shred cool. a lot of paper. And the guy from Shred It said that it was an unbelievable response given that we weren't on a main street. He said there were more people at this event than he's seen in a lot of larger communities. So huh. I, I hope, working with the Glen, that that will become an annual event. Um, and Miami Valley Regional Planning, nothing. I, I, I intended, and I'm sorry I didn't put the minutes in, in for the meeting in, um, nothing really major happening there. And um, so what's future agenda items, um, the next meeting, so we have two second readings. Both ordinances have second readings. Um, so when we can change, John Courtney is actually going to be here on the 27th. With the roles and responsibilities, we're really done with that. We can take that off the agenda. Yep. Um, Karen, I'm, 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 I'm a little concerned about the, the work session, having the, the sidewalk policy discussion in the ACE task force. Uh, oh, yeah. Because I'm, well, I'm looking at time now and... Oh, I know. You know, mm -hmm. I, I, if, if, if it's possible, I, I, could we only have one 
either one or the I, other. I don't. Because I, I, you know. Yeah. I agree. So well, who's, it, which, which long. one, you know, which, so John, I mean, I guess John's working on one. Mary Ann, I think we're telling you to go ahead and work on this other. So what, and which one is, of you wants more time? This isn't discussion, though. Right. Of course, it's just coming back I, with a proposal can, for how to. That's true. Okay, okay, so if, if, if all we're going to do is bring us a plan. So, but, so you will, at that meeting, you will bring the plan for how, okay, so that's, okay. let's okay. do that. Okay. okay. Yeah. yeah. So, right. so you're still on board. Just, you're still I mean, on for, yes. Yeah. So we just need to make that, that clear yeah. to yeah. the people in the audience because it's really easy to read yeah, that cause cause thing. I, like have people come loaded for Baird and talk about it and say, no, right. we're really right. 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 I missed that entirely. So what's happening with Marianne there? She is simply bringing a proposal. Plan, a proposal for how to frame the discussion and when. She's got we're good. And then you've got the ordinance for your supplemental mm -hmm. for your remote readers. Um, so, she'll uh, just put it as part of the supplemental appropriations. Okay. That so may that's not be. Yeah. Okay. Well, there's also um, the rezoning for the yeah. uh, yeah. yeah. ordinance. Did you get that ordinance for rezoning? Yeah. That I there's an ordinance for yeah, rezoning, we'll and, and there's also a, a possible ordinance for that street vacation. Okay. In agreement. Okay. So we have so we'll, so our ordinances are the sec the second readings of the two we heard tonight. Um, possibly the street vacation that will be an ordinance and supplemental will be an ordinance that will. She probably won't have the supplemental, but you'll have the rezoning ordinance for what's the address? One of four. One. Oh. Um, and and I, what about the street vacation? He, he's, yeah, street vacation, the rezoning on Xenia, and the other two. Um, I would like to point out to council that the meeting after that is, in fact, a work session. So you yeah. either have to have a special meeting beforehand to do the second reading of those, or you have to put them off until the next meeting. Just so I just want to. Well, and we also that. just just name decided we were going to do three readings mm -hmm. right that's what i'm saying you're going to have all of those ordinances are going to fall at the work session yeah and we can't do that third reading in a work session um yeah. you can't do any second readings in it you have to because the other ones will be on second readings chris i i'm sorry to ask you this again can we can we do an ordinance we can't can we do an emergency ordinance in a um no, we can't. Never mind. I mean, I'm answering my own question. You, no, okay. you have to. You have to schedule a special meeting before or after the the work session to do an, a, an ordinance reading. Correct. Right. Correct. Well, or as you, long can, as or you in, leave them. I mean, yeah. those two, I don't have we any concerns We might want to begin about. begin that May 18th meeting at six o'clock and, and, and do, do one or the other. And do the what we need to do, and then mm -hmm. go into the special session at seven. I mean, the, the, the work session of saying yeah. that. I, I, yeah, I'm just pointing it out so council yeah. remembers that that's right. the way yeah. it has no, to be. And that we advertise it as such. And, you know, don't push it out and we don't have it. Is there any chance that you two could potentially be ready for um, a proposal on the task force by the next meeting on just on how we're going to approach by the 4th? Yep. Let's do that then. That's a good okay. idea. Mm -hmm. I don't think it'll look. And then, so then maybe what we can do then for the 18th, 18th is start at 6 with a work session yes. about sidewalks, then we'll move into a regular meeting. I think it, I would do it that way, have the work yeah. session first. And then, and then, right. then. Mm -hmm. okay. Great. Um, and then the other thing I did add. Um, one other thing we did put that so on June the first meeting in June we'll have a charter review presentation yes I want to get that on the agenda June is right around the corner and as and uh, Lori just pointed out to me that we're nearing Patty's um, first anniversary so we'll have a wow. review and we'll need to get working on that and um, so and you uh, need another executive session I would say Yes. Right. Mark. So. Okay. Well, let's. Well. Yeah. Let's and move maybe, into. Maybe um, just for future reference, if we could get closer on the timing, because our public, 
public hearings and legislation, we have that taking 10 minutes tonight. <laughs> and I don't really know, I don't know if it was just left over from some other time when we were doing uncontroversial ones, but it's pretty rare that we can get right. through. And we knew that, that the delinquencies was not gonna take 10 yeah, minutes. Yeah, it was left over. And so I, I think it would be really good if we could get more in the habit of thinking that through and, and really thinking, well, how long is this gonna take? so that we don't get these meetings that wind up taking us to 11 o'clock. I, I have another question. Are you going to be, when or, when is a solid waste contract? Next, I, the, the draft of it will be next time, but um, actually it's not the contract, it's the questions that I have for council about how you want the contract written. Okay, okay. thank you. Okay. So um, are we going into executive Yes, session? I would like, a, and I thought we had two, do we have another we have, executive session? We have, yes. What is it? Litigation. Potential? Mm -hmm. Well, didn't we just decide we were only going to do that one issue? And what I would, uh, what I would like to do is at least, what I would like to do is at least ask Judy to stay and make a plan for when we're going to do it. Because if, if we don't. Well, couldn't we just do it at, do, but, do but, this at our next meeting, the other? Do we have other executive sessions? Yes, yes. we have potential litigation. Yeah. No, I you mean at, Judy's at, the at March 4th. Correct. Just, or May 4th. Are you just with May do 4th Judy at May 4th. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Except that we don't have a plan. Um, oh, a plan. So yeah. we'll just, oh, I we don't have an evaluation. Saying. We haven't decided okay. on what evaluation oh. format oh. we're going to do. Um, but couldn't we so do that at our next we can, meeting? We'll just, we'll have to. Okay, I would appreciate a motion for to go into executive session for the purpose of discussion of potential litigation. So moved. Second. Wintrow. Yes. Askland. Yes. Sims. Yes. House. Yes. McQueen. Yes. Do we anticipate coming back into a public session after 